Coming up next, The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy. Every Thursday from 4 p.m. right here on RCR. Reality Check Radio. Welcome to The Crunch on Reality Check Radio. I'm your host, Cam Slater, and this is the place we crunch the political issues and cut through all the politicians' spin. There's a lot happening around the world politically, and it's all very interesting. And that's why I've got political dark arts operator Matt McCartan back on the show to give us some insights into what is happening around the world. And then I'll have a chat with Hugh Devereaux Mack from the Council of Licensed Firearms Owners to talk about the world of firearms, legislation, and a way forward with proposed gun law changes. Naturally, we'll hear from Cam's buddies and see what they have to say about Darlene Tana and the Green Party shenanigans that is going on. And of course, we'll have the whale bag to get your feedback as well. Don't forget to send comments to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. On Monday the Green Party tried its best to paint itself as the victims of Darlene Tana. Naturally, there'll be some sympathy for a party embarrassed by an aberrant MP who has misbehaved and continues to be a thorn in the Green side in Parliament. But let's be clear, this scandal is of the Green Party's own making. From recruiting Darlene Tana to facing the dilemma of invoking Walker jumping rules, the Greens have created their own mess now they must lie in it. The Greens' handling of the Darlene Tana allegations has been nothing short of disastrous. They first became aware of the allegations on February the 1st, but failed to deal with them properly from the start. Instead of investigating the problem, they took Tana at her word and hoped the issue would disappear. And it wasn't until journalist Steve Kilgallen exposed claims from former workers at Tana's family business, that the Greens admitted the problem and suspended Tana. They then commissioned an inquiry by lawyer Rachel Burt, but have kept the process secretive and opaque. For four months, the Greens refused to answer questions about the investigation and offered vague responses about why it took so long to conclude. And even now, the public remains in the dark. Co-leader Chloe Swarbrook expects us to trust her interpretation that Tana isn't fit to be a Green MP, but she hasn't provided any details from the report. This lack of transparency is unacceptable, especially when $43,000 of taxpayers' money was used to fund the report. Tana has publicly challenged the report's findings, claiming it does not accuse her of migrant exploitation. Yet the public cannot judge the truth because the Greens insist on keeping the report secret under the guise of privacy issues. This lack of disclosure is a disservice to the public and fuels speculation of a cover-up. The Greens promoted Tana into Parliament without thoroughly vetting her. This isn't the first time a Green MP has faced a major scandal over personal integrity suggesting that there is a systemic issue in their candidate selection process. The Greens must take responsibility for the behaviour of their MPs, and it's clear they need to improve their vetting processes. Now, the Greens face a major decision. Allow Tana to stay in Parliament or use the Walker jumping law to force her out. Problem is, they've historically opposed the Walker jumping law and Swarbrook is now considering using it, which is both hypocritical and astonishing. This rule, which the Greens have denounced as anti-democratic, might be invoked to solve their problem. If the Greens do decide to invoke the Walker jumping law, they need to write a letter to Tana stating her departure from the caucus distorts the proportionality of Parliament. And then Tana would have 21 working days to respond. The Green Caucus would then need a two-thirds majority to vote for her removal, 
followed by membership approval. And whether the Walker jumping rule is used or not, the Greens' disarray looks set to continue. Swarbrick's tactic of shaming Tana into resigning could become very ugly. Other parties avoid such disarray by dealing with untenable allegations more efficiently and openly or forcing the MPs to resign. The Greens need to regain public confidence in their integrity. And the most obvious way to do this is by releasing the full report on Tana with necessary redactions. But the Green Party must apologise to the migrant workers at the centre of the saga and focus on fixing the integrity problems they've caused. It's time for transparency and accountability. And only then can they hope to regain the public's trust. But the drama in Parliament is far from over. And that's where it becomes entertaining. You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR. Reality Check Radio. Matt McCartan is unashamedly from the left in politics. And yet he and I are good friends who have always had communication lines open. Sometimes it's good to peek behind the covers and get a perspective from the other side. There's lots happening politically around the world, so Matt and I are going to have a wee chat about what we are actually seeing, not what the legacy media thinks we are seeing. Matt McCartan, welcome back to The Crunch. It's uh, good to have you back. Well, thank you for having me, Well, Matt, um, there's a lot of things going on in the world of politics, and a lot of people look at things from you know a centre perspective or a right-wing perspective, and I thought to myself this week, you know what, I think we need to get a dark arts practitioner on the line and talk about some of the things that go on behind the scenes that give us an insight as into politics from a left-wing view. And it doesn't mean it's right or wrong, and you and I have known each other for a long time and operated in the back room on various different things, so sometimes against each other, but we've always had a convivial uh, ability to communicate with each other. Of course. Of course. Now, you know, the most um, the most uh, thing that people are talking about at the moment is uh, is the U.S. election. Yes. All right. Now, if you've got a dud leader and you're an advisor to that dud leader and you have a debate debacle like what happened to Joe Biden, what would you do? Well, it's obvious what needs to be done. You need to get down. Yeah. Now, um, but if Dale Latrell said he's another campaigner, and he was the one who ran um, Obama's successful campaign, his first one, you know, I, I liked his summer, his good campaign, his first, they make it pretty simple. Well, what do you have? Uh, denial, uh, delusion, and defiance. Mm-hmm. And then you've got all three. And what you have is, is, is Mike Moore, the left wing um, filmmaker, I uh, was saying, um, I think, yes, yes, yesterday, it's like him going on that show to do that interview or, or, or that debate was elder abuse by his... I actually think that Biden's hand ham was for amateur. And, I, and I'm sure you have to agree with me, right? As people that we've run campaign. Dale, his advisor must be a small group who he's got into group thinking and with the wife, the American politics is funny. They have their partners as kind of co-leaders, you know, where we don't have that tradition, thank God. And well, not every case. I mean, Ronald Reagan had Nancy Reagan, but she was, uh, you know, had a back, she took a back seat to everything. Well, a lot of Kylie, she, 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 she did go and see the, hor- the horoscopes and they would and try and convince them of certain things. So, and when he got out of Alzheimer's, the only stage of Alzheimer's, that she was a very important player. You know, and what they've got with those first ladies, which they all have been up to now, they get their own office in the White House with staff. I mean, that's just, that's astonishing. And the influence they have on it. And so Jill Biden is playing in way out of line and sort of influence on Biden. You know, Christian. You know. Yeah, no, I, I, last week I had I made a comment about uh, Jill Biden's the one most responsible for pushing 
dear old Joe. I mean, I, I you know, I don't agree with his politics, right? But mm. he does look like dear old Joe Grandpa, who's forgotten everything and oh, yeah. being pushed forward by Jill Biden. Anyway, this commenter said to me that it was the most appalling thing that I've ever said. Um, you know, bringing in his wife. And I thought, hello, have you been watching and paying attention? And you've just said that, you know, the first lady has an office in the White House and you see Jill Biden pushing Joe Biden forwards at every event. Uh, she introduces him. She winds up um, his speeches. She guides him on and off the stage. She's involved, right? Jill, she was what they call... You know, we call the, um, I'm not, I'm, I don't know what the colonel is these days, but you call them the, the body man, right? And it's the person who's with the candidate the entire time, making sure they don't trip, making sure they get to the right place, make sure they don't look in the wrong direction, making sure that they speak to the right people, if it's right. That's what she's doing. She's the personal campaign manager. That's what she is. And she's not, um, she's not a, a, a she's never been a candidate herself, never been in politics before this before. And I just said, tried what? She was an intern, though, wasn't she? That's how she got to meet Joe Biden after his first wife died. I didn't know that. But that didn't me. Because we know about a, full, a former president sort of an intern that doesn't go well. But what we've got, you see, they say, oh, well, he's going to have a, the photo shoot with his family at Camp David. And the son goes, you know, the one who the wrong, the wrong son died. Um, and so Hunter goes along there, and he's the most senior of the uh, the family there. And him and Jill are pushing his stage in, and of course everyone goes, "What are the granddaughters all supposed to do?" Oh, Granny Pop, don't run! They're not that. You know, just it's just the group thing, and that's what's going on the whole time. Everyone can see it. The emperor without clothes, and they will lose if he stays in. They'll rip the party apart. They will go into a state of depression, and they will lose. And his comments were saying the other, the other day when he was asked, I'm just going to do my best. As long as I've done my best, if Trump wins, well, then I just know that, that I'm okay. What? What? And, and it's like that, 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 that arrogant, that hubris. Look, I've always thought that Biden, he comes across with his grandpa, you know, and Pete Sinden, he's honorable and that. But, you know, you've watched him for years until you have, and I have, right? And... He's been running for president since he was 83, and, um, you know, and Obama got him in. You know, he got him in, he got in the country at last. And, you know, and, we, he, and, you know he, he's had, I think, quite a success from a center-left point of view. But I catches up with us. And, you know, the Americans don't know when to leave the state. You know, they keep staying. We don't have that culture here in the country, right? And I, I and you, your listeners, some of the practitioners will know, and you're listening, you know, America being the first democracy, you know, has really got an imperial presidency with the checks and balances, but the checks and balances don't work, and they never would work. Um, and what what the rest of the Western world has to varying degrees is there's parliamentary democracy. So if someone is Gaga, the caucus can replace them, and they do, because they, and if there was a vote of all the elected reps in the Democratic Party, that Biden will be out and out, no question. But because of them, they say, so we, we've tied all these, um, the delegates at the convention, which is the group that votes on it officially, but that's just a rather stamp, but they're all done to them. And then he says today, well, they can challenge me at, at, at the convention, which you know, Phil, well, they can't. It's crazy. You know, and so he has also now been defied. And that's a new way for him to be exposed, I think. And look, so it's just a train wreck. I think he will be dumped. I will, he will uh, capitulate. Because once those Democrats all see they're about to lose their seats, that will give them a photo. See, the thing is, is that they've got the 25th Amendment, but that is damn hard to use to get rid of a president. Well, they can't get rid of a president. Like, they, they, even when you impeach them twice, when you go to the Senate, for the crime, but yeah, and I know it's a different thing, right? You need 66 of the, of the court. They said it's never going to happen. 
The other thing about that, 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 um, that, what, what do you call it? The chapter 20, 20, 20 of them there. Yeah. Where they, um, think, but that means the cabinet's got to initiate that. Well, no, actually it's the vice president. The vice president has to go to the cabinet and oh, the cabinet I, I, has okay. to take to the yeah. floor of Congress, right? So, yeah. so, so you know how political process works. You never go for the king unless no. you can get the king, right? Yeah. So, so okay. that means Kamala Harris. Who, who wouldn't know how to count to 10 if even if she used her fingers? Well, that's a bit of a how to count. Yeah, well, you're being a bit mischievous of here, but she is part of the problem too. She's not, see, vice president, to my view, um, you yeah, know, they, they get handpicked because they're safe. And they should do a lot of work to take the load off the president, shouldn't they? Well, um, we know it's all just the show. Vice presidents have no power, they just there. But Biden is over on the other side of the country, picking someone from the west side, a woman, someone who's not white. You know, she ticks the boxes like you are now the um, uh, the the the, the vice. Um, she should go with well, them. Like her should have a complete clean, uh, uh, you know, uh, an old lake. But Jacinda are doing in our country with the lake um, uh, pick, and she won. So you can still win at a lake. Because it changes the whole thing, you know, new, fresh, you know, um, change, yeah, big loss of the Yeah, yeah, you are right. Yeah, you can do that. But the problem the Democrats have got is that the sunk costs so far of the Biden campaign. And the reality is the, the, the front runner, really, from looking at everybody, I mean, there's a whole lot of people, that, you and I could name some names and no one would know who they are, Right. But if we said Gavin Newsom, everyone would know he's the governor of California. He's the one who's actually out there. If you look at his um, feed on X and on Facebook, he's actually making us a, a, a play to be the candidate. You know, yeah. he, he's giving the language. He's been giving the for three years. Oh, no, exactly. Surely not. We'll get you. All those things going on for years and debating with the Santas and around the country doing ads around the country. He's just still doing it for the good of California, I'm sure. It's like Win Winston. Have, have he been the uh, MP for Carol? I'm not ploppy. Um, so Gavin is out there every Sunday being very supportive of the president if the president wants to continue. Yeah, but he's the governor of California and he's and he's making speeches in Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> Now, what if he wants to share his uh, love to, to the country about the greatness of California? No, you're absolutely right. Look, 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 he is the one. He's the brand. That's, that's who. Now, a lot of people don't well, don't like it. doesn't matter, right? What they, In my view, if I was uh, had a play yet, I'd go with him. And I know all the problems they can point to about Cal, Cal, California, obviously. But as you know, with a campaign with Trump, none, none of that matters. What is about the scrap? You know, and it's about... The um, one who can fight, well, you know, and what the Dem Democrats they want to champion, the industrial champion. They send you out a, a, a wheelchair bound guy who the shark been around that you want him. They do Trump is, um, yeah, you know, you're on my side of the well, let's it. face it, but Trump's a bully and he knows how to bully people very, very well. Well, he's done it all his life, right, and got away with it. So he's the thing, it's a winning thought to tall man. Everyone is scared of him, Newton is not. He'll, he'll revel in it. So what you've got is a guy who's young and vibrant and, you know, cut and up. Um, and, you know, good up himself, too. We're even surprised for a politician. Um, but I think they need someone like him. There are some others. They won't bore your audience with names because, you know, they're just names. There is one other name, though, um, Matt. Uh, and again, it was a reader who said, oh, Cam, you know, your analysis of the United States when I was talking with Olivia Pearson uh, your analysis of the presidential race was typical, just simple, red versus blue. And, you know, what about Kennedy? Now, you know, you know and I know that that my analysis of what's happening in politics is never just red versus blue, right? There's nuance to everything. But you know, what about Kennedy? Is he a dark horse? Could the Democrats perhaps select him or make him uh, uh, on the same ticket as Newsom? Or is he too much of a dark horse or a maverick to to try and... Uh, corral. I mean, I think some of the things that he says is why are you saying this with a straight face? Some of the things he says are. Everyone um, says, you know, why can't we just all hold hands and 
just have a nutcase come in and, um, you know, in the bar case, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a drug convicted fat fellow, you know, and still caving in like that. And he, you know, you, you go, narcissist, you know, why can't, and his vice president, very well, Bob Dollar, his running mate, that's like he couldn't again, you know, like you've got a lots of I think, with the last serious third party point. Yeah, and we didn't hear. And at least he was self made. And it wrote and touched to some of the issues, which people want, and you've got to give them some respect, right? And, um, but no, he's not, look, these third party candidates are running. He's not the only one, but he's obviously the one with the brand, um, and the money now. And, um, and that's not because of them, it's because of Biden. Those, those candidates are actually the left candidates by and large, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and um, what there's about four of them now, five now, that old Mariana or whatever name is come back 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 in again. That's because everyone knows that, that Biden, the Democrat candidate is weak. And so playing away sort of at, at you just funny enough with Paul Kennedy, just as many Republicans will back with them on the back Trump. They can't bring the the vote for a Democrat. So here's a general protest campaign candidate. Look vote split it really, isn't he? Well he is, but it's not about him. But it's about the dissolution vote. And you don't have a parliamentary for a of them, or like we had at NEP, you have weight and vote, so people uh, can't bring themselves to vote for the other team. So they'll give it to him or one of the uh, uh, others. But that will hurt Biden. I mean, Biden's post. And anyone who, 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 who gets up and puts their pants on the correct, correct thing, no, 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 you know, when they get up in the morning, like everyone knows that Biden. Um, yeah. Now, the only reason that Biden has any chance of succeeding is not because of him, but because we and Trump vote. That's the only reason. It's all about Trump, not about Biden in terms of the fear. But by Biden, is, um, he, he, he bugged them right, really. Apparently. The Democrat strategy seems to have been to use lawfare, to smear Trump, to, to denigrate him, to do all of this, and yet he's still forging ahead. Yeah. And, and 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 going so you'd have to say from a strategist point of view, tying someone up in lawfare means that they get unearned uh, free publicity, where the public only hears Trump, 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 Trump on the news. Mm-hmm. That is, in in my experience of you know forty odd years in politics, and you're about the same. That, in my view, is the worst thing that you can do is to have other people talking about your opponent all the time in the media. Well, I, I well, yes, I think that, but this is it, is that it feels a lot like an am, am, amateur hour in, in, in the state in terms of campaign, right? You know, having Trump on trial on, on, the, on the case, you know, in, in, in New York, um, you know, it, it feels like, you know, um, it was a parking t- 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 cricket case. With, if he hadn't have been running for the presidency, they wouldn't have made it. Right? They wouldn't have. And, and people know deep down they wouldn't have done it. Now, is he guilt, guilt, guilty and all these things? Absolutely. But, but to the alienated voter base, which the Democrats have pushed away as well, right? A lot of these people who vote for Trump used to vote for the Democrats as well. That's working class. And so recruitment against, and that's all over the world, including this current country, right? There's working class people used to be on the left now, don't see it as their home. They've been pushed away. And so what's happened is this resentment and against, against the system. And Trump is that kind of unreasonable voice that goes against it. And they go, well, someone is, is, is expressing my, my, my anger and hatred of the system and of the people who run it and, and think, so what's happened then is that when Trump gets up, as, as you know, and all your listeners are aware, is that every day in Washington, in, in New York, he was on Time Time News all day with his message. Now, the fact that that was true or not didn't matter, right? Because he wasn't a rebuttal. It wasn't like two people come out, you know, Trump is guilty, he's a crook, he's going to jail, you know, and he's all the reasons why, so they get their five minutes of their messaging. Well, it was with Trump coming out saying this is a scam. I'm in that. I'm in these set up and gone. Oh, it's all you heard day after day after day after day. And then they get surprised by no like to be taken off them. 
True. Well, that's the thing is that is that if you look at Nate, Nate Silver, one of the best pollsters in the world, right? Yeah. yeah. He says that there is – it's a baked-in result for Trump, yeah. right? Because everyone knows he's a rat bag. Exactly. Everybody knows he's a braggart. Everybody yeah. knows he's a bully. Yep. And they don't care. That's right. Of course, their hatred of those who rule them is far out right. They actually enjoy – watching the elites win. And that's them. They love them. Right? You're watching a scallywag and a rascal yep. um, campaign doing the same things every election yep. and getting in, and it's a delight. You know, for, for people well, like... You see a lot of that politics, but it's driven by, you know, the, the, the resentment of people who have not done, who, who have been pushed out of the drive New, the new world order promoted by the left as well as the right, yeah, the elite right, not 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 the rank and file right, but the elite right and the elite left, right? And so yeah, free trade is good, you know, yeah, we 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 can free it up, you know, technology is all good, AI is good, you know. Now the fact is that you can't work and earn a living and have the manner of uh, being able to raise your family is not important, you see, it's your fault, it's your fault. And so what we have is, 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 is not a left-right fight now, it's the have and have not fight. And, and, I think, and I think on that, you and I agree, Matt. You've come full circle and I've come full circle and we've ended up pretty much at the same place where we've got these ruling elites in these large parties that actually ignore what is going on in society. In, in classic cases, Chris Hipkins last weekend Standing up and saying, you know what, um, you know, I'm going to listen to Aucklanders. What? Well, hang on, mate. That's the same playbook that every opposition since, um, you know, Noah was a boy has used. It's like, they, let, let's go out and do a listening tour. You have a look at who did it. Bill English did it, right? David Cunliffe did it. Phil Goff did it. They, they've all done it. And how did it work for them? You're not particularly well. Not really about the truck. As you know, right, it looks patronizing because it is. Mm. No one believes you You believe that because uh, you're from Wellington, so they don't believe that you care what all can think, you just want to pretend. Now, here, here, what, you know, you and I would like to think that we give them advice, but I just use. What people want to hear is, yeah, we got it wrong, and here's how we got it wrong. If you tell with what you got wrong, you got no business in being in politics. Oh. Well, go and speak to the head, speak to the people. You wander around and speak to people who agree with you um, or are polite to you because Kiwis are polite. So, no one, you don't really get through, right? What you've got to do is you've got to know if you don't know why you've lost Auckland, then you don't have the privilege of being a politics. You're right, though. Kiwis are polite. You know, in all of the dirty politics years, when, when you and I still were talking and, and we still do, you know, we, we ignored Nikki Hagen, <laughs> you and I. But no, I only had one person who ever said anything, but from the protection of his car as he drove past. One person. And yet, if you believe the media, I was the most hated person in New Zealand politics in 2014. I thought, too, you were. Um, but quite Italian. <laughs> I'm quite Italian. I'm good. They are too polite, because only one person ever said anything. No, the good chair. And... and you know, I, I once was uh, talking to Max Bradford just before he got tipped out of office, you know, in, in uh, when Helen Clark took over. And um, he was saying to me, oh, I says, um, I walk down the street in, in Wellington here and people that I normally bump into and talk to, they're crossing the road. I said, that shows you're going to lose, mate. And he and he couldn't, he didn't, he didn't believe me. And I said, well, you'll find out. Already your phone will have stopped ringing, right? So... Come the election, your phone definitely will stop ringing. Okay. No one cares. No one cares. Well, as soon as they're crossing the road to avoid talking to you, you're losing. Oh, you mean they were crossing the road to avoid them? Oh, I thought you were yeah. crossing the road to come and see them. No, crossing the road to avoid them. You'd see them coming down the street and then they'd see them and eat, they'd cross the road. And he oh, was like, oh, wait, because uh-huh. you're a loser. And just, yeah, when you're here on the hill, we're just saying now, you know, you're here on this uh, inherently polite. Mm-hmm. And, and always. Always. And it's now, you know, I've got friends who are, who are overseas people. When they come, come here, they think it's very, it's sort of endearing. But after they've been here a while, they actually think that uh, they said, no, they're not 
inherently polite. They're pack of aggressive. New Zealanders are very pack of aggressive. You know. So if you get if you get Chris Hipkins turn up to your workplace because he wants to listen, he stands there in the lunchroom. You're already on the back foot. You're thinking, why don't you why don't you go away, mate? I'm having my lunch, right? And then he says, starts talking to you. You're not going to say anything. You want him to leave. Anyone who asks a question is going to encourage him to stay. You know, and so you're right. And it never works because you're pissing off most of the people and the ones who do talk to you are usually the sycophants anyway well pe- people just like I, I, look i find that i think it's just, just embarrassing because someone will be get up with a pet peeve about something which got nothing to do with it there and they go all right you pretty, pretty shut up because, because it's just for you to hear other than you think right you know and um you know i'm here to listen to you well don't you know you know um yeah, they- so, so, you know, the man on the street, you know, I need to hear, they won't say, I'm busy, can you get out of my way, because I've got to get to work, or I've got to get home, or I've got to get out of my lunch, you're right. But anyway, look, I think the point is, we expect our, our, our politicians to know their minds and to be conviction. You know, the one when they have conviction. Look at the uh, the rising of, you know, you know, some quotes, but you're right. You know, look at the Farangi, the Farangi, you look at the, um, and the Pen and the other, you know, what they are is, and left used to have it too, right? Conviction politician. They say, this is what I believe. They're not trying to, same with Trump. We're not trying to win the middle ground. We want the middle ground to come to us. We stand for something. And um, and I think what the uh, center left does bad, badly is they think they chase the, the, the center ground. And so, so does the center right. And that's where you have um, in France, for example, you have collapsed of the traditional two parties, the Socialists and the Republicans, they're still here, yeah, but they're in a very small, you know, we wouldn't even think about it. So um, Macron, you know, goes and form the, uh, the centre of his, his, his party as a way to defeat the two traditional right parties. What's happened though, as you know, the conviction politicians of the left and right are actually what's winning the mood. So we have, you know, the Republican front and the um and the rally and the Republican right rally the the pen crowd is that they're the ones who are catching their ma- imagination. You just see that all over the world, it's always conviction politicians who who who, who, who catch them. You uh, look at the UK and you look at France and, and, and I've seen the statement from Christopher Hitkins saying, oh, you know, this is you know, this is great for the left. We're seeing the left um rise. I'm not sure he's reading the same tea leaves that I am. I, I'm seeing that incumbent governments that were there when COVID was in place are being replaced. It doesn't matter whether they're right or left, right? Yeah. So the Conservatives in Australia got tipped out in favour of Labour. You know, people are having second thoughts about that now. Uh, Labour's just won a massive election in the UK and think that, you know, it's because of the merits of their argument rather than everyone was just sick of the Tories. Um, with their corruption and, and nepotism and everything else that goes with, you know, UK Tory politics. Um, and then you've got Marine Le Pen surging in, you know, she in the second vote in their strange system, you know, she didn't do as well because the left... Well, and- well quite, quite lined up, yeah, you know, just like lined up. But you're right, well, but here's, here's the thing, in you know, it's what was the battle cry of Labour, you know? Uh, we aren't the Tories. We yeah, aren't the Tories. It's the same as, as the same as National did here in no, the last exactly election, right? right? We like and, Labour, but less shit. And you know as well, but it is is that you know governments lose, opposition don't win, you know. Yeah. And you know the Tories have been in for forty years. I couldn't have said, you know, they're going to go on forever. Cool, but we get sick of them. They won't change. And Labour won from the previous election. Got two more percent. Mm. Yeah. That in mind, it's all about landslide. The first part of the post, and because the, because the vote was splitting, they came through. France was different because it was, as you would know, that after when the Gaulle post war, um, it, it's basically an imperial pre, pre, presidency, and a lot of the power, certainly in foreign affairs and military, it's all on the presidency. And the parliament, why they had that two that two step period, the Gaulle wanted to get rid of the decrees. So what they do is you all got to run and then it cuts down to it and have another round between the two top because it should be the socialist and Republican, you know, who come off. And so it's a safe bet who gets the numbers. What's happening 
unfortunately for them, loss of confidence, the cracks of the centre, is that the Le Pen crowd had risen, and then the far left had risen, now, and that was four weeks, so when we talk about Biden, well, the, the left, hard left, in four weeks, went from nothing to now the biggest number in the world. That's why the times can go like that, because then they have social media and instant news. So each country has its own reason, but your analysis is correct. It's that it's not a left-right thing, it's an incumbent and challenger. Yeah, and, and, and a fight back against what people perceive to be the elites, whether it is or not. And that's why it's strange when you see Biden came out uh, on Tuesday saying, um, you know, oh, it's the elites of the Democrat Party and they don't have <laughs> Right. Yeah, because of the elite, because Bernie Sanders had the numbers on the roll, so Obama and all the elites went and they pushed everyone into voting for Biden. Biden and, Biden's and, the ultimate elite candidate, isn't he? He was the elite candidate, and still is. They so put on about the elite and say, mate, 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 but we, we know it's, it, 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 it's, it's desperate times for him. Look, he, I, I don't mind him, but he's just you know, 80 years old and he looks like 100, you know? You've got him yeah. with Winston Peters, right? There's a big difference, isn't there? There's only one year difference in, in age. Uh, well, that, well, that is true. And uh, look, we had given up on wait and wait and wait and wait for Brent to die. I, I, yeah, I remember hearing breakfast with him like a mere year, 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 and I thought, and I thought he did yeah, then. I thought, oh, I mean, that give it up. Yeah, he'd been in and out of Parliament. And then I didn't go, oh, I think about retiring. I said, oh, give me a break. I said, they will take you out of this place in a box. He's never retiring. Um, and we should just get rid of that nonsense idea. Um, and he's having too much fun. Um, well, he's, know, able, he's able to have fun because Luxon's so weak. Well, exactly. And, um, and you know, he, he's, got, he's managed that centre party lower end of, of working with both major parties. Like, that's that breakdown with late label to Winston was astonishing, you know, as how that was mishandled. And when Hipkins was on the ropes during the election campaign, he was bad mouthing Winston big time. We will not go in with him. And I'm thinking, well, what? Well, what? You know, learn to count. You ain't got to meet. And uh, I, and I've uh, broken down, right? And, um, you know, I was saying to the Labour crew a couple of weeks ago when they were all, you know, appalled when moving forward, and I said, you know what, here's the problem. You had a majority in your own right. You could have done whatever you like, and you did nothing. You know, we've had this discussion before. What if the Leeds, the Leeds, the, the crack, I mean, um, uh, the Adan government, or the Hitchens government? They could have done whatever they like, pass whatever they like, Transformed the country in their own mould and got away with it. What they, they had these lofty promises and zero delivery. I mean, you promised, she promised in 2017 light rail to the airport mm-hmm. by yep. 2022. Yep. And mm-hmm. it, not a single millimetre of track mm-hmm. was laid, despite and, $200 million. Well, because you had the numbers in Parliament, you've done whatever you like, you could have just done it. And, you know, it needs to be able to point to think this is what we've done. And um, when Hipkins took over in a year, a year, you know, think you just go for broke. Just go for broke. What I found amazing, Matt, is that Winston Peters, forever uh, the the consummate middleman who was happy to work with anybody if they gave him the right deal, they managed to piss him off so significantly that for the first time in 30 years, he came out and said, I'm not working with them. I'm right. Faltering. And here's the thing, you see, with Winston, and you know this to be true as well, right? He's old school. Well, he was one of them, handshakes mean something. Yep. You know? And um, I'm in the guy, you shake right? his hand. And he's never, I've never known him to break a deal. Mm. When he shook hands, he, he's old school, never broke a deal. And it's astonishing that Labour, when they were in government with, with, with him, did not understand their about him and lied to him and told him things which weren't true. And then they get surprised that he then goes uh, fear on Winston holds grudges. I know he does. You know, he he he, yeah. he dislikes yeah. 
Carter intensely. But he was still a professional, even though he had that dislike. And he was, he's very professional on those things. Yeah. But he holds grudges and he he never lets it go until he gets you. And even no. he will stomp it. And so, you know, that's what I see the driver for Winston Peters behind the COVID inquiry. It's it's not so much to find out the truth of the COVID, you know, we kind of know where that's going. I think he wants to see Hipkins and Robertson and Ardern squirming in the inquiry. That's what I reckon. Well, that could be, I'm sure, but most people have gone, have gone past COVID. They don't really care anymore. They've moved on. No, no, there's a lot of people who do care. You know, no, but, the economy is suffering yeah. from well, it now. I, I, so, I, that, look, you know. I, I think, you know, it's from, for not very matter, but my cousin's word, uh, they didn't address that in the election campaign. If I was a if I had been Hipkin, you just narrow down and say, we did the right thing. I'm glad we did it. 20,000 20, 20, New Zealanders are alive today because we took the hard measures. Now, could, could we have done some things better? I double all the little, 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 early, all that. Yes, we could have. But we had to say to New Zealand, I believe 20,000 families are watching us tonight. We say, we're well, one. And just be completely our, our, our apology. You just go for it. Now, the people who oppose them and those who have gone beyond COVID would have voted, they would have to vote against them anyway, right? What? And they both grief and conviction. We did the right thing and we do it again. And we do it faster, we do it better, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they would have got their own vote. You see, but it's that kind of thing is what we're doing now. Oh, we go around listening to you. What do you think? So, well, don't you know? You know, it's like what you're supposed to know. I'm just going to lead the country, got to know your own mind. So, you know, I think it's just a symptom of, of, of the problem of the centre left and probably but like the centre right too, you know, the very traditional, you know. Because uh, I think they have more in common with each other. You know, it's our turn now, and you take opposition. And, but what we've got is a new politics to the right of the centre right party, to the left, yeah, you know, to use both terms. But they both are angry at the elite. They feel that the elite have not, they don't govern, you know. And so I'm just saying, in public, just slightly the same thing. See, someone, uh, some DJ got the set um, last night or our last night. Because she got sent the question to ask about Biden from, 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 from the White House. And she asked, asked, asked the question that the White House gave to Biden. So Biden could, could they now the point, oh, on a radio show today, and oh, he would put on the question. Well, they all vetted the question to the RTP. So people say, we do not trust the mainstream press. They're interested in those who rule that. And this is one example. And so Biden's on the road. They give questions to quit you know. And they get the answers and they know what they're And that's do. exactly what Ardoon did and that's exactly what Luxon does. And what they, they, they well, well, I don't know the detail of that. I'll take your word, your word ready for it. But what we have is the press are used as players in the game, yep. not not putting, you know, whole, whole, whole power, power to account. And, you know. It, it, that's it, where it, Trump wins when he says the, the media are the enemy of the people and everyone goes, it, damn right they are. You know? <laughs> that's right. And he, and we know that he, yeah, well, he, like, I mean, he, he's like, a braggart, and he, and he, and he um, you know, uh, likes to exaggerate things. But, but that's what he is. Now, just before we wrap up, Matt, let's t- touch on a couple of things in New Zealand politics. What the hell is going on with the Green Party? I mean, let, let just let, we don't need to talk about specifics, right? But we've got James Shaw left. We've mm-hmm. got uh, Chloe Swarbrick um, doing all sorts of crazy stuff. You've got MPs uh, self-immolating, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there a systemic problem in the Green Party? From from a backroom political operator, I really want your opinion on this. I think it's always been there. Um, and the Greens are a brand. You know, it was funny in like the year, years ago when they first come up and, you know, we on the left were writing them off. And I said, oh, no, brother. They're still but, there. No, no, I said at the time, I said, they have a nice colour, all right? And that's what's going to defeat the red colour. Green is a better colour colour than red. Yeah, that, that's the future. And everyone will scoff at the time. And so the Greens, you don't actually have to believe them much. See, I'm, I'm, I'm a Green. They have integrity, though. You know, Jeanette Fitzsimons and Rod Donald were highly integrous yeah. people. Yes, I know, but they came from the left. Yeah. You know, real conviction for public politicians, right? Yep. What come out of the lab, the Labour Party tradition? Jeanette came from the Values Party. Great, great. We have a talker into coming into the Greens. 
same was so when the Greens formed, Ryder and Smith joined later when they were in their lives, the Greens were in their lives, but it was in our interest to have competent people who ran the Greens. Mm. So, I'm blue green, et cetera, et cetera. But the Greens themselves um, have, you, you can actually have any ideological drift in your life. And what you've got is you've got people being elected of MPs on, on, um, it's almost like, you know, it's a phenomena of individuals who support themselves. And the Greens pride themselves on being uh, decentralized and we are over them, them, them democratic. So if people just come in because we have to have at least 50% more, we need more at the minimum of. So that the people they've had trouble with, and it's not a female thing, but it's just a coincidence that that's what it's been, is that people are going in underqualified, no links with politics at all, no links with the Green Party. They just come in, I'm an amazing person, they can speak at a conference and suddenly they get word, well, people get word and they vote, vote for them in. And James has been going the hard yard to the union with a tradition in green politics all the way. They either um, make it like a misery by deselecting him but not replacing him and they bleed out there for months. And this is how they treat him. Oh, that's the green, that's the way we, you know, we treat people. No, they don't. They don't look after their people, but the wrong people in there. The green on Paris, and recently, you know, we know they will be, um, that they're falling like flies. Mm. Um, and what it is, is one, they're not being, whether they get the right people in there. And you, your father, who was involved in the National Party, but the selection of candidates, you can look at, you can look at, what are we doing here? I don't think there's really anything going on. Like, oh, we don't like to do it, not go here. So. Well, you know, that's just fearless. And then when they mess up, which they do, it's kind of like someone else has got to make the decision. Getting a lawyer in, who, you know, for 40 grand, you know, and paying the MP and sit outside for half of the time that she thinks he's in Parliament. Why they re- why they do an investigation on the obvious, on the obvious, you know, so what are the, it's, it's, I think that the, 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 the lack of uh, skill, the lack of um, responsibility back to the people who voted for them, they've allowed, it doesn't, it's about, it's about five MP the last five years have been through this process, right? And then it's kind of like, oh, well, you know, we've got to get it right. No, you knew from day one to what the problem is. Right. So yeah. How would you handle it, man? I mean, I've got a fair idea. You'd probably sit the 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 EMP down that's been doing whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. They could have been visiting prostitutes or drinking heavily or whatever. It doesn't matter. Doesn't you sit matter. Them, you'd sit them down and you say, right, fella, we've got two choices here. One involves a sword and one involves a razor. You can fall on your sword and we'll let you go with dignity or we'll cut your throat. And either way is messy. So you're a harsher man than me. I wouldn't put it quite like that. <laughs> I have a talk and I said, what's your future? Mm. And oh, I'd like to be in a minute. No, I mean, out of Parliament. What would your future be out of Parliament? <laughs> and they go, okay. No, but I, no, 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 no. I'm a messenger. I'm not a negotiator. I'm not here to negotiate. I'm here for a message, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And then I find out what they'd like to do outside of power. And then you give them a job. Help them. And say, look, we can help you because they come with skills, you see. Then they treat their manner. They treat their, you know, their, 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 their salary. You know, because most of them is the best job of their ahead. Um, but what, what, what would they say? They pay the most. They have the least work. And everyone all thinks their IQ jumped by 20 points. And they... Nerd before they went, and suddenly they can go to party, and people want to talk to them and hold on to their ears at every word. As you said, the start of the uh, call, once they lose their job, the phone stops. We we'll never hear them, you know. So, it, but you're right, I've had to do that to a number of MPs, and it's fine, it's bloodless, you know, and it's done with kindness, and you know, you got to move on. And you know, didn't you have a press conference and say, you know, due to family commitments, you know, I've decided to resign and move on. I mean, eat tired and, you know, and, and, and you think about they can move with, well, with what you expect. See, but if you don't do that, this is what happens. You, you, you know, see, now what we think quite rightly is saying to Chloe, uh, uh, the, the deputy, uh, the co-reader, saying, well, the Greens have a way out now to say we want to out, out of the parliament. Mm. Right? Will they do it? Probably not. Uh, probably not, because that... The... Well, on your hand, saying, oh, well, we believe in... No, no, no. This is about the people who voted for you. 
part is need to stop our non as you and I don't know, no one knows who the EPs are, we're not on the list. They just trust the parties, know what they're doing, they're going to put some people up who, who, who won't mess it up and will add to it. That's their responsibility. When they fail in their job to put decent people up with a balance of skill set to trust, then the party leadership has to move. They need to replace them. And a product line. What they're doing now is wringing their hands, oh, what we can do, where we just bystanders through this. Not since why they're it looks like they, they looked pathetic. They were begging, begging her to resign. Like they, they should have sat her down and said, right, what is it like you said? What what is it your future look like outside of Parliament? Well, once she understands, we will move had you expelled. Mm. So that's never been put to her. So the problem the Greens have got, although hypocrisy's never troubled them ever before. No, but what they've done is see I assume the news item going again, connect that soon as the great uh, the late great you know, United States Mary of the movement, she was opposed to expulsion of MPs. That was then. This is now, you know. And I, and I never agreed with Jeanette at the time, but 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 yeah, they had this law that somehow these MPs when they get elected, they all think they're so special and they had such honour. Oh, no, they're just ordinary people, and some of them make mistakes and shouldn't have been in the first place, and that's the party's fault. But anyway, that did. They should say. And I'm with you, I wouldn't put the razor blade and sword down because it's a bit brutal. Um, but my thing is, is with her, they say, look, this is what you need to resign because you put us at terrible risk and damage, you've damaged us. And if you don't go, you have no choice, we'll move to have to have you expelled from Parliament. Now, if you go, so look, I, I don't I don't think it's entirely fair. My husband has it seems to have made mistakes. I was involved with the business but I've had to take with spot with Bob on Maria what he did. And I'm sorry to all the supporters of Victor. That builds your goodwill. The next time that there's a committee when they're in government that may need someone on some road road board or something who no one can think hears about, you can could you help them help others there, right? Because that's what you do with people that are experience. So I I look at this the screening P, um who 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 who, who got expelled from the caucus of A thirty three three for Recon. You'll notice that no one from my head has come out and supported her. That's telling. Yeah. Right. That, that's her local community. Yeah. Cricket. Because they all know. Tells, they you, know. tells you everything you need to know. What that business has been up to. And, and agree to know. Nobody, nobody in New Zealand is going to believe a word of it, of any word that comes out of her mouth that says, I didn't know what my husband was doing. It's a small No, no but it's, yeah, but it's a fig Um, Because sometimes you just need to let two people go. You know, and they got to go with some dignity. things. You say, look, I'm so sorry for the people who 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 have raised these issues. There's a legal process underway. I can't speak about that. When I was going to run the parliament, I withdrew from um, uh, the business and the running of business. And my husband, I left with him, but that's a failure of judgment on my side. I should inquire more, whatever, you know. And and I'm so sorry I put the Green to the position in the community. And I uh, refer of tears, hand in your resignation. And everyone goes, okay. Yeah, you know, good old, old gold ears, you know, it's a, yeah, I, I think. But again, you see, and I, look, I know she had her trauma, but everyone who does a crime had trauma. You yeah. know, when, when is there one rule for the poor workers who make, or boys and craft who make mistakes, or ordinary people who make mistakes and go to fire jail and get drink? You know, if someone from South Auckland went round to a high street store, family, Tens of thousands of dot 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 dollars went on a couple of hundred grand grand a year and then go, oh, well, I'm traumatized. Do you think that the, the judge go, oh, you poor thing. Oh, look, look, we'll let you off. Oh, it will cost me. And they clean. Right? And so, you know, we've got to stop this always allowing people to make excuses for their behavior. Yeah, and it, and it, it creates the impression that elites do exist because they get a soft Blow through the. Well, I hadn't thought about it like that, yeah. So, what we've had is they can dish it out, then they're scraping all that, and they've taken all the privilege, and they get good privileges, you know, invited and everything, and, you know, that, that, that. And she goes, oh, well, you're a deep gun, I wanted to get caught. Well, like, can you just stop doing this? Yeah, like, like she said that. I couldn't believe it when she said that. I thought, clearly, um, someone as smart as Matt McCartan's not advising her. Yeah, um, right. because, right. you know, because, no. because, because, it just doesn't cut it, you know. Like she says, I wanted to leave Parliament. Well, yeah, okay. we just um, had an election. You could have said I'm not standing. Exactly. And so, look, I think because whatever. And people, you go with your record. 
you and I, you say, we come from a different school, right? In politics, in the, in, 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 in the civil society, you get involved in politics, and if you're, or, you know, you, you, you have very strong conviction beliefs, and you, and you pray for or you'll keep hard for. When you make a mistake, or you do something wrong, you cop it sweet. Yeah. You don't go and complain. No. Sometimes you just shut up and disappear for a while. Why? Like, why it calms down. You don't go, oh, well, you know, I feel anything. I have mental health issues. I've, I've felt like resigning. Well, just and, resign. And you say, you know, because no one cares. It's not about you. Yeah, and shut so, up. Use the door. Yeah, and look, and I don't mean that, like, because I'm not a brutal person. But what I do think is about stop making it about you. You know, it's about the people who vote for you in a civil society for you to do your job. You don't do your job and you preach their values, but you're everyone else. And it's about hypocrisy. And when you do do that, cop it sweet. Don't make it work. You know, one thing I know about you, Matt, is you speak quietly but carry a big stick. Well, I speak quietly because what are you for shouting? <laughs> yeah. And then you can hit them with, well, well, with a stick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, well, thanks, Matt, for coming on and shedding some Thank light you. on, the, on the, what happens in the back rooms of politics. It's always a pleasure, and we'll have you back again sometime soon. All right, All right Matt. Thanks so much. Thanks, Matt. You know, it's funny. Matt and I have always had differing politics, but the more I talk to him, the more I find that we have more in common than we have differences. We need to have more conversations like this in politics where we can discuss things without rancor, or getting upset, or taking it personally. What do you think? Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy, right here on RCR. Hugh Devereaux Mack is the spokesperson for the Council of Licensed Firearms Owners and Deer Stalkers New Zealand. You may have heard him in other media getting machine gunned, excuse the pun, by hosts and interviewers. Well, that's not going to happen here. We're going to have a good long chat about firearms, firearms legislation, and we're going to bust some myths and hopefully educate you a little bit about firearms. With me now is Hugh Devereaux Mack from Colfo, and we're going to talk guns, aren't we? Absolutely. I think we're going to have a great discussion about a, a number of topics today. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm a, a firearms enthusiast. I'm a member of Antique Arms. We just recently had our gun fair in uh, Arms Fair in Auckland, had about 500 members of the public through. Um, there's clearly a strong interest in firearms. Um, a lot of those were family groups that were coming coming through. People were buying and selling firearms. But there's uh, been a whole lot of demonization, hasn't there, of firearms owners and guns in general, um, particularly since an Australian t terrorist came to New Zealand and actually broke all the laws and the police failed all of the licensing requirements. And somehow it's the firearms owners that have been punished. It's interesting because that's actually what brought me into the Council of Licensed Firearms Owners to begin with. I got sick of seeing our community put up and blamed for a police mishandling of the current laws. Like they completely failed to administer the laws of the time that would have kept us safer um, and denied uh, the terrorist a firearms license. And yet somehow we were then being lumped into the same category as him. And I didn't feel that was right. Mm. Um, so that's what brought me in. Like, like you, I've been, I mean, I started rabbit shooting with my father when I was six. Um, graduated to shotguns and um, rifle shooting and hunting after that. Took a break through university because it's actually quite hard for young people moving around and flatting and everything to own guns. Um, but now live in Wellington, homeowner. And so I've got back into it, both working uh, with Colfo as a volunteer and uh, the New Zealand Deer Stalkers um, mm. in marketing. So I get to think about firearms and these issues full time, which is great, and help our community start rebuilding. I guess our image that oh, successive governments following the uh, the terrorist attack really, really destroyed for us. Yeah, they talk about um, the need to make all of those changes and we needed to have a buyback, which actually was a confiscation, but uh, because of public safety, uh, because of one person 
uh, I, I hesitate to use the term running amok because it's not technically correct. I mean, if you know the un, 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 where the mm -hmm. word amok comes from, but but that's what the media use. So let's just keep using that. One guy broke the law, and the punishment was not him being imprisoned. He was imprisoned, uh, but the punishment was then meted out against every other shooter in New Zealand with the buyback and uh, very restrictive policies that saw a large number of firearms confiscated by the police and destroyed or theoretically destroyed. Mm. Yeah, the interesting thing there was, you're right, we were all punished for the acts of someone, for the acts of a terrorist. But what really concerned me was after it all happened, like we didn't have a say, the law was rolled out within sort of seven days, it was announced, there wasn't proper thought and I think firearms owners, we were all horrified by what happened. Obviously, it was the worst terror attack New Zealand mm. has ever and probably will ever see. All go, like, But the fact that this law was just, it just felt too quick. And we should have waited until we'd actually seen the results of either a coroner's report or the Royal Inquisition to say, yep, the laws that we want to change now based on emotion are actually going to reduce gun crime in future. What we've actually seen is criminals are still using firearms to do harm in our community and the gun crime rate seems to be rising every other weekend there's a new headline of a shooting or guns being found in the hands of criminals in main media so we were promised the buyback where or rather the confiscation and compensation event we were promised that the register would stop it we haven't seen those results so when are we going to change the approach and instead of punishing license owners when are we going to go after the criminals more heavily you know that's allowing them to plead down on firearms cases yeah, I mean, that's what staggers me, right? If you poach fish and get caught by the fisheries officers on the boat ramp, you'll be prosecuted. The fines are tens of thousands of dollars. Your boat, your car, all your gear, and everything associated with that event of fishing is confiscated, never to be returned. You commit a firearms offence, and it gets pleaded down to almost nothing, and probably they don't even spend time in jail these days. And I've had this argument with multiple police ministers over the time, over time, the current police minister, the former police minister, and the police minister before that, and said that the, the, the penalties are, are not in keeping with the severity of offences. And we're all for, as shooters, we're all for penalties for people breaking the law because we have to jump through hoops. And if you're like me with a collector's licence and, and prohibited licences, there's a lot of hoops that you've got to jump hmm. through. The safe requirements alone uh, is a substantial investment. You know, if someone wants to steal my safe, they're going to need you know a crane and a truck and the ability to move two and a half tons by themselves. You know, it's just not going to happen. So we've got all these requirements on us. Um, have had those requirements for a long time, and I'm, you know, a little known secret is I helped actually draft the 1983 Arms Act oh. um, when, when Peter Hilt rewrote that. And, um, and I was the one who came up with the idea of presenting a, a, a license to buy ammunition because I said at the time you didn't need a license to buy ammunition back then. And the Arms Act was actually quite a, a nice piece of legislation. Where it's fallen down from, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but this is what I, my perception is, is where it fell down is the police kept going to a compliant police minister and asking for regulations that were never promulgated into law. And so there's a whole vast array of regulations that no one knows about that mm -hmm. aren't published anywhere that's easy to find. And then they go and snap people for those breaches of regulations. But in many cases, the regulations were nonsensical in the first place. Mm. There's a, there's because a couple they were dreamed up by a team of people in police national headquarters. It's a problem. Yeah, there are a couple of points to pick up on there. One of the first ones is actually jumping back to the original I guess after the terrorist attack, the mongrel mob actually, their spokesperson put out a thing where they were asked whether they would be complying in the confiscation event and whether the mongrel mob would put their firearms back, uh, whether they'd be uh, they'd be giving their firearms back for compensation. And their spokesperson said that actually the New Zealand public needed to trust them that they would only use the firearms that they illegally held on each other or on uh, other activities directly required to their business which to me was astounding because they were admitting they had illegal firearms and they said, no, we're not going to give them back, but we should trust them 
where the government was coming after licensed firearms owners who have no criminal record, are some of the best vetted people in New Zealand, have gone through the mental health checks and everything else, vetting, unlike Tarrant. And then we were not to be trusted, but they were, these criminals. Following on from that, um, a lot of the regulations and things that have come in post that have been punishments for having a firearms license. A lot of New Zealanders don't understand that if you want to, if police want to raid a, a gang house to go after drugs or anything else, they need a search warrant from a judge to approve that. If you're a licensed firearms owner, you give up that right. And for purely the act that you followed the law, you got the, you jumped through all of the hoops, you ticked all the boxes and you proved you were fit and proper, you have the privilege of allowing police to raid your home and search it without warrant and without warning based on rumor or let's say an ex-girlfriend uh, says they don't like you. Police are allowed to raid your home for that, seize your firearms and put you through an expensive court case. I don't see how that can be uh, deemed an appropriate thing that the rest of New Zealand should be happy with as a precedent. And I agree with you there. And having been the victim of, of uh, one of those attempts, you know, in the US it's called swatting, where yes. your political opponents uh, lodge a complaint, an anonymous complaint to the police, say that you've got a firearm or you're going to commit suicide or you're, you're talking about that. Next minute, the police are charging through your door and, and uh, you know, the political activists are hoping that, that you'll do something that will end up you getting shot. Yep. It happened to Rachel Stewart, um, our political opponents. You know, I had two police officers arrive at my door, knock on the door, fully armed with Glocks, tasers and, you know, vests, mm -hmm. uh, car parked out the front. And, um, you know, they, they took a softly, softly approach, luckily with me. They came to the door and they said, oh, you know, we're, we're here to inspect your safe. And I said, well, I've been here for four years and it's already been inspected. So have you got an appointment? And this is what I did is I insisted that they follow the law. Mm. And the law is, is that if you want, if they want to come and inspect, they have to give you a date and a time and a reasonable time. They can't say they want to come and inspect at five in the morning. But there they were on the doorstep, the police actually breaking the law, trying to get me to let them into the house. Mm -hmm. I insisted that they didn't have an, uh, an appointment, they didn't have a booking, and they hadn't given me seven days notice as required by law so they could leave. And they argued for 20 minutes about their insisting on staying to check the safe. And I said, mm -hmm. well, no, you've said that that's your purpose of coming here. You don't have a warrant. You don't have any other reason to come here. So I'm insisting that you follow the law. And I sent them yep. on their way. But not many people do that. You know, I, I know shooters that have been stopped a kilometre down the road from a gun club, and the police have said, oh, well, you're just at the gun club, and we want to check how you're storing your firearm in your vehicle. And they let them check them storing the, vi the firearm in the vehicle. But a vehicle is the same as a home. If they want to do mm. that inspection, they have to give you seven days' notice. But a lot of people think, oh, well, they're the police, I'll comply. But the police are actually breaking the law, and then if they catch you, then they prosecute you, even though they broke the law to get you there. I think one of the key things you've identified there is it's not just a, oh, we'll just let them because they're the police. There's the fear of repercussions. So how many times have licensed firearms owners uh, come onto the wrong side of police because an officer didn't like them? I had a case uh, a couple of days ago of a... Uh, an individual who came asking for help because his former partner had been shacked up with a police officer, took a dislike to him, and suddenly his license is being revoked and challenged, putting him through an expensive court case because he's just got on the wrong side. And so what this really comes down to is a systemic problem with how the system is currently set up or has been built over a number of years, mm. where the police are currently the judge, jury, and executioner for everything around firearms. Now. There is a bit of a step of a step of progress separating and to, to Tari Pureke, the TPP Firearm Safety Authority. They're still within police. So as that moves away to justice, the administration portion needs to step away from the uh, the enforcement part of it. But we also then need a real clear justification of what does fit and proper actually mean. In my view, and in Colfo's view, that means unless you have a criminal conviction and that is passed down by a judge, then you are by default a fit and proper person. 
It mm. shouldn't just be something police can arbitrarily remove because of an anonymous complaint on the internet or an officer just saying, you know what, I, I, I want to search your car because you've just been at a gun club. If you say no, then maybe you're not complying, maybe you're not fit and proper, and maybe this is going to lead no, to a court exactly, case. That's exactly what they do. They say that um, to your face. You know, yep. like that's what the police said to me when they were at the front door, and I said, no, I insist you follow the law. And they said, oh, come on, mate, it's not going to go well for you. And I said, was that a threat? Oh, no. Yep. I said, oh, good answer for the video. You Which, know. Um, <laughs> it's it's interesting because the Firearm Safety Authority recently put out their, their very selected survey that was – uh, basically, trust and confidence in police to administer the law is at an all-time high, and they made a big deal of it. We finished our own one of licensed firearms owners. Granted, we can't send it to every firearms owner like they could. They didn't in this chance. In this case, they sent it to people who had recently got their firearms license, so no one who's sort of experienced or been in the community for a while. I mean, if they really wanted to know how trust and confidence is going, they have everybody's emails, everybody's contacts send it to all 243,000 of us and see what comes back. But we know they won't because even the Colfo one with a couple of thousand people on it uh, came back as the trust and confidence in police to administer the act without bias scored a massive 1.6 out of 10. <laughs> like, <laughs> And that was January this year, taken from our 2023 results. Um, so unless they've done a drastic thing in the last six months, I don't think they've improved it to two thirds of licensed firearms owners believe in them in seven months, but that's that's the spin now, and I understand where they're coming from. Um, they need to be seen to to justify the fact that TTP being set up is improving the confidence and building these relationships, and there is a potential for that to happen, but it's not going to happen in seven months. It's also probably not going to happen until they're outside of police's control and able to rebuild the relationships we used to have with our arms officers prior to 2019. Like the fact that they turn up to our houses, they can look at our criminal records, see that we have no record, no violence, nothing. We pay our taxes, we're law abiding, but they feel that they need to turn up with glocks on their hips. Mm. Any citizen being confronted with armed police at your door, regardless of time, day, or even if you haven't done anything, it's a quite an intimidating thing. I mean, we're around firearms a lot. But we've never been on the receiving end of one of those when you know that the person has or could have ill intent towards you and they are fearful. Like you see it happening in the States, which is why Colfo first spoke out saying armed police should not be the default New Zealand. I don't think we're at that point. I think it's a terrible idea. Mm. But being on the receiving end of armed police is mentally quite fragile, like quite uh, shaking. There's a, there's a whole different side we can get into about the mental health around firearms owners and why we're no longer reporting or asking for help. But the other side is the constabulary turning up to your door, maybe at your workplace or in front of your neighbors. It's just an embarrassing thing to happen and makes you feel like a criminal, even when you've done nothing wrong except obey the law. And that has changed the fundamental community policing model to, shit, firearms owners are more fearful of the police and less likely to ask for help, which is not what we want. No, you have a problem. the guys in my club, we, we all used to be G-men, right? We we thought the police were on our side, that we'd assist the police. And then post-2019, there's almost nobody in the club that will go out of their way to assist the police in any, in any way or regard. And, you know, before the before the register came in, we had a visit at our – we're the largest club in, in New Zealand, being in Auckland – we had a pretty full turnout um, at a meeting where Mike McElwraith came to talk to, uh, and he had a, a lot of his offsiders came to talk to us about the the, the register that was then coming in. And um, he said, "Oh, well, we're engaging with the with the community," and everyone said, "We well, haven't talked to us, you know, you know." And then then proceeded to lecture us about how bad we all were, and uh, and how this was going to solve a lot of problems. And then when the questions started coming about how the register was going to operate, we quickly realized how little thinking had gone into the register. And I'll give you an example, right? So um, somebody asked, well, what do you do with firearms that don't have a serial number? And, and you might think that all firearms have serial numbers, but serialization of firearms mm. didn't start happening until industrialization, which is post-1900, right? Yep. So we asked this question. And Mike McElroy said, oh, all firearms have got serial numbers. And I said, mm -hmm. everyone just laughed at him. 
And then we then we said, well, now what if you've got a firearm that doesn't have a serial number? He says, oh, well, that's easy then. Um, this is what I'll I'll put an instruction out that you're to use the largest number that's on the side of of a firearm. And we all just laughed. And me, who's a Martini Henry collector, yeah, cracked up laughing, right? Because and and I've gone through the process of re- going to the register, and we'll talk about the register in a minute. But mm. I've, got, I've now registered ten Martini Henrys. Five of them have the same serial number, which is 1887, because the mm-hmm. largest number on the side of the receiver is the year, yeah. is the year it was made, <laughs> right? And um, and then I said, well, what what do I do with um, this Gehendra rifle? He says, what's that? I said, well, it's a rifle that was made in Nepal. Well, you use the serial number they put on it. They were handmade. There's mm-hmm. no serial numbers on it. Any numbers that are on it are in Dev- Devangari. How do I do that? And, yep. and no answer. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and then if you, you, you interact with the um, with the register because you have to because of, you know, you're buying or selling or whatever, you go in to register something. I registered my, my Vickers machine gun, for example, and it said to me, uh, and I went to the pick, pick down list, oh, yes, Vickers machine gun, here it is, calibre, yes, 8 millimetre, mine's an 8 millimetre Mauser. Mm-hmm. And then it said, uh, how many rounds in the detachable box magazine? Mm-hmm. Well, it's a belt fed machine gun. Yep. <laughs> I've, had, I've had other people have very similar. One. An interesting one we found is there seems to be a, I mean, obviously not everyone that could be hired by TTP has to be a firearms expert. Not everyone can be. But we had someone literally two hours before this conversation contact us because they were having problems with the individual who was trying to help them through the phone line. A, having an online system for a group of people who are older and not necessarily the most tech savvy even signing up for a realme account is quite challenging for some of them I'm tech savvy and i had trouble registering things yep. on <laughs> then there's the oh in order to sign up for a realme account you need to uh, get a text message to your phone when people are in areas that don't have any cell phone reception so yep. i've had stories of people having to drive down the road to get the number then driving back and time for the before the timeout happened yep. so there's ridiculous things like that but then the phone solution was Presumably quite a good one to sort of mitigate the the older people, so fine. But the woman on the phone was asking, like, oh, is the uh, is a revolver got a detachable magazine? How many how many rounds does a six shot revolver uh, hold? I'm like, I mean, that's in the that's in the title of the <laughs> of the thing. And so I think it's understandable that the the confidence in those administering the system is relatively low. Um, but likewise, the belt-fed box magazines, all the rest of it, Peak View Range has done a few sort of TikTok videos and things on their rather funny experiences with dealing TTP. But yeah, it's it's just a, a fascinating situation where we have some of the basic level of knowledge is missing from the people that are supposed to be keeping us safe. And I don't see experts being hired into their either their policy team um, or their administration. But But it's, you know, the register was supposed to be easy. Easy to use, mm. right? It's not easy. For example, I, I've I've moved house and had a marriage split up, and that's always difficult with firearms because there's so many things that can go wrong there. So what I did is I moved my firearms, uh, all the pistols, onto one person's license, and everything else I've moved into another guy's strong mm-hmm. room. So we did all the paperwork for the pistols. And supplied a list, you know, of all of the pistols that I had uh, to to the police, who then transposed everything and then spent forty minutes on the phone with me saying, "Well, you haven't got a, um, uh, you haven't got this one. That's not on your license. Uh, well, well, actually, it is, but it, the serial number is this, not that." Mm. And so we'd actually provided them with with an Excel spreadsheet that they could have imported. And it was just a d- debacle from the beginning to the end. And so what should have been a, an easy transfer from one license to the next license, because of the intervention of the person at, at, at um, the Tari Pukeko, which is what I call it, mm. you know, um, turned into a mess. And it was a prolonged pro- progress. And then, even then, I still had to go in to the thing and then transfer those to the other person's license. And yeah. That's the bit that's getting missed out, that people are, are selling a gun, the person who's buying it goes and registers it, but it's still on your license because you haven't gone and transferred it to the other person's license. Mm. And it's just, it's turned into, like I'd say the data in that database now is a mess. 
Already. I mean, yeah, you're not wrong in that. So uh, having looked at their recent, they just announced that the first anniversary of the, the firearms registry has, has passed. They said 220,000 firearms have been registered by more than 46,000 license holders. So that's 20%. I'm like, okay. So that's 20% of people. A, clearly shows how few of us are, well, I mean, the firearm, firearm sales. Yeah, we're doing everything we can not to trigger the register. I know yeah. firearm safety sales are down, uh, firearm sales are down, talking to uh, dealers and importers, first off. Um, so, A, we don't want to register. But then the other one is the fact that we're having these problems like you've just outlined at only 20% of us. What's it going to be like in, say, five years' time when you have 80, 90% of us registered, however many firearms? Um, the fact that we say there's there's millions of firearms in the country, they were surprised to hear. They were like, yeah, that's, it's probably like maybe two, three million firearms. They were just surprised that it could be anywhere near that many. I'm like, well, average person, like regular hunter-shooter, three or four is pretty typical. Yeah. Um, 22 or 17 HMR. Uh, uh, 308, um, a shot, couple of shotguns, pump action over and under. Yep. Like, and there's, there's, there's four, four right there. Right? Yeah. And that's let alone if you have five, you know, maybe you have a tar hunting long range rifle, or maybe you have a 308, like a, um, yeah, a bush gun of some sort, lever action. Yeah. Yep. And then just the, a couple of fun plinkers, let alone if you're into, uh, well, what used to be three gun. I don't know what they're doing now that the, the E cats have been removed. Um, but pistol shooting on top of that. Um, as well as the parts, that register is going to be an absolute mess, which is why Canada scrapped their one in the end. The magazines. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, a metal box with a spring in it now has to be registered, for those who don't know, right? Mm. So I've got rifles that have got magazines because you know, they're M16s or, or SLRs or whatever, and every one of those magazines has to be registered. And what mm. people are doing, because they don't have – this is the other thing we said, well, hang on, we've got collector's items. And you're wanting us to put serial numbers on them, destroying yep. the value. And the police didn't care. No. They just don't care. But but go, let's go back to that conversation, right? We, we talked about some numbers, you know, the numbers you're talking about, two or three million firearms. Mm. How many guns did the police say you got handed back? I can't remember the actual number. Um, it was a thousand, wasn't it? Yeah, like I mean, if you, even if you look at the funny thing is they should know exactly how many firearms they were expecting because they had a firearms register prior to 2019 for ECAT firearms as well as pistols. And so when you look at how accurate the, the pistol database was and the ECATs. They were in a register as well, remember? Yep. So all of those, they should have known exactly how many firearms they were coming back. So they should have been able to say, you know what? We got 100% of all of these firearms that were legally held by people. If they had done that, I'm, I'm sure we would have seen the headlines celebrating it. The fact that we didn't see celebrations of that or even being highlighted to me suggests that actually there were more out there than they possibly knew or had accurate records of. And who knows where those guns have ended up now? But here's the thing, right? I know a few gun dealers. And under the old act, every firearm that was imported in New Zealand had to be imported with a permit. Mm. Right? So if you're bringing in, for example, um, a container of SKS rifles and container fulls of SKS rifles were yep. imported to New Zealand, right? They were very common back in the um, in the eighties and nineties. You could buy an SKS rifle um, for about four hundred dollars, uh, and and a box of ammunition, ten thousand rounds for you know, about the same. Yeah, and I know that there were many containers that were brought in on those, and I know approximately how many SKS rifles there are in a container. Mm -hmm. Well, there weren't that many SKS rifles handed in. Yep, where are they? <laughs> in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in the thing. I know that. I, I know uh, that for sure. They weren't handed yeah. in. So where and are we they? Know, and the other interesting one there is they said that they never had a, they never had a register or they didn't know how many firearms were coming into the country. Every That's firearm, right. as you say, has an import permit that needs to... The, the funny one was I called them out on this and said that, look, you know how many firearms came in because in order to import a firearm, you had to tell police exactly what you're importing. And then they said, oh, we, we don't have the serial number for those because it isn't required on the import permit. And the answer is like, technically, they were correct. It isn't because you don't know the serial numbers until they arrive on the ground. You mm -hmm. then had to provide the serial numbers once you received the firearms within, I think it was a month. 
And so it's like, yeah, technically you've dodged the question to say we never had the serial numbers. Actually, you did have the serial numbers. It was a month later and then strapped on or bolted onto the national security database system. But there was no uh, legal requirement to keep a track of those. Therefore, it wasn't an accurate database. So they needed the new register to fix this. I'm like, well, if you had a database that was working, granted your people weren't following the law, which I mean, we've never seen that happen before, shooting back to the Christchurch conversation. So you had a database, you had the serial numbers, and yet you're not being able to track these when they're in criminal hands. They even said, I think it was 86% of firearms seized, oh, 82% of criminal weapons. They didn't know the source of them. I'm like, right. So what is a register really going to help with this if you already had one and you just didn't execute it properly? This is the point I raised with Mike McElroy. So I said to him, you're saying that the register and, and the gun control people as well, you know, Hera Cook and, and um, Philip Alpers, mm. every now and then, yes, we need to have a gun register because they're registered everywhere else in the world. And go, yeah, okay, sure. What about Canada? And we won't talk about Canada. No, no, Canada you can't mention Canada. It's been $2 billion. $2 billion, billion. $2 billion and cancelled it because it doesn't work. Australia's yeah. register is a complete debacle. Yes. Um, it never worked anywhere in the world because it requires humans to input input things and humans are fallible. Uh, and then on top of that, you've got the situation where you don't you had you didn't know what you were starting with in the first place. Mm-hmm. So you might say they say, Oh, we've got two hundred and twenty-five thousand firearms registered in the register now. And I'm sitting there thinking, hang on a second. I know five people in my club that have got probably between them five percent of that number. Mm-hmm. The big more. collectors will be some of those early ones, like people who own hundreds of firearms. Yep. yep. I mean, I don't envy them the paperwork they had to do for this as on their own personal time, let alone the changes and any hand mistakes. But you're right. Like the the register would never be completely accurate because it relies on humans. But skipping apart the accuracy and the logistics, let's say we had a perfect system of firearms of every legal firearm that was imported every time it was traded between licensed owners. That doesn't stop the criminals who, A, before the firearms register came into place after it was announced, police reported an increase in the number of firearms they were seizing from criminal hands that had the serial number removed. Therefore, before the register was even there, everyone was like, oh, well, screw this. We'll just remove the numbers and that'll protect us a little bit. The other side was it was a recent piece that was written around the number of containers that were scanned at ports. And it was around 7% of all shipping containers coming into the country were actually searched or scanned. 7% is not a lot let alone the number of debanding sites around the site, around the country where they can be opened, farms, everything else. They say, oh, straw buyers are the number one identifiable source. Mate. Yep, many, well, and, they've only, and they've only given us three examples, right? Yeah. So, and I mean, to be fair, those three terrible people should not have been given firearms licenses in the first place. Punish stupid. them, lock them up. Great. But, they, but then those three were not caught because of a register. No. Right? They weren't caught because of a register. Let's let's, yeah. let's let's need to understand that. The register didn't catch those straw buyers. Those straw buyers were stupid. Yeah. They went and bought 20 firearms of the same kind by themselves. They drew attention to themselves. It wasn't mm-hmm. caught because they were registered. And yep. and, then, and then when the police went and, and followed it up, they then discovered that some of them had been distributed around the place and some had turned up in crimes. But you're right. You can have a serial number, and, and the police always say, oh, well, that we not want, need to know where it came from. Well, you can have guns stolen. And I can tell you right now, if a, if a gang member came into my house and held a gun to my head and said, open the safe. Yep, here you go. Thank you. I'd, I'd open the safe and I'd ask him if he needed help loading it in the van. Yeah. And Don't this is a guy for a criminal. This is one thing that Gun Control New Zealand and uh, the sort of anti gun mob have not really understood when they hear, why are you so opposed to registering your firearms? And it's because when we say, oh, it puts us at risk, they never really ask how. And the answer is, previously, criminals could know, okay, we know our address and we know that this person owns guns because they're probably not that shy about it. They might have a few Facebook posts or whatever else. And that's if their uh, their operation security is bad. If they're keeping themselves to themselves, then let's say the list of firearms owners is compromised, ends up in criminal hands. They can look at it and go, okay, Joe Bloggs, 
Joe Bloggs lives here. He has a gun license. We don't know what he has. I don't know if it's worth it. But now with the new register, when that is compromised, and we've seen data comp breaches from police even after the confiscation event with lists of licensed firearms owners details being found in the home of a criminal who knew enough to keep that list. Mm. Luckily, it was only Auckland addresses and names and didn't have the details yet. Next time, it'll have the details and they'll say, you know what, these three houses are rural and they have 10, 15, 20 firearms. I might go there armed myself because why would I turn up to a gun owner's home unarmed? Mm. And if they have family members, if they have children, if they say, look, Gives you guns, unlock your safe, show us where it is, or I'm going to hurt your wife, I'm going to hurt your children, or you. You're right. We're going to say, we're really sorry about this. Here it is. Take it away. Go for it. Please don't hurt our families. Because that matters more to us. And it's just, for whatever reason, because these individuals don't have something like that on the line or, or could risk it, they seem to have empathy for every other group being safe and feeling secure. But when given a real problem for our community, that empathy is gone. Nothing. It's like, well, we need to feel safe. I'm like, but at what cost? The default uh, demeanor from police towards firearms owners now is that you're a a potential criminal and Mm -hmm. we're we're just waiting for you to make a mistake and we're going to catch you and we're going to do you over. Completely right. That's how most shooters that I talk to feel towards the police. And it wasn't just shooters that back that up. In the law review, the Law Society came forward and spoke out against the changes, saying that it was a reversal of the innocent until proven guilty principle. So Mm. for the first time, licensed firearms owners were treated as guilty and then needing to prove that we were innocent. All licensed firearms owners have felt that since 2019. And the the interesting thing is, if that attitude were to continue, and if we were to see more restrictions placed on licensed firearms owners, higher costs for licensing, further restrictions, restrictions on what we can buy, but not seeing the same level of punishment for firearms crime, how many people are going to say, you know what, I'm going to opt out of the licensing system. I've got my guns already. I'll be unlicensed. That's not a situation that any New Zealander should be comfortable with. It's not one that licensed firearms owners are comfortable with. But if they continue pushing this line of further restrictions on us, I can imagine more people are going to end up going down that path. And I'd say most of those would be in the rural areas. Yep. Right? Yeah, it's just... too hard. It's too hard to interact with with the police and register and all the rest of it. It's just too hard. So no, no police ever come out here anyway. Even if we have a, a burglary or rustling or um, it's something you know untoward happening, we sort it out ourselves because the police are two hours away. I think I heard um, – oh, we, we deal with a lot of uh, issues with poaching in the South Island. Um, of deer and everything else. I believe it was something like two police or two rural police officers to cover a large patch of South, uh, North and South Canterbury. So they basically believe that if an incident happens there, there's two officers, no one's going to police it, no one's going to follow up, no one cares. And so, yeah, you're right. Like, how are you going to stop good old boy, good old girl who just has the arrival for pig hunting or deer hunting, whatever else, just owning it, keeping quietly to themselves? Right now, bulk buying some ammo before it's on the registration process or getting ammo elsewhere afterwards, we lose the approach of we need to restrict licensed firearms owners further is going to lead to people saying, I'm just opting out of the licensing process. Mm. And that's not a good it's not a good outcome. And we want to avoid it. It's it's like, you know, the, the whole register process that we went through, they they talked about, oh, we've educated people, we've done this, we've done that. And yet every day there's incidents of, of firearms that are coming handed into gun shops or magazines being discovered down the back of a safe or something like that. And then, you know, I, I actually know of several cases where the gun shop owners have gone to register the, the magazines, right? And they might be rare magazines. Mm. They could be uh, you know, they could be M16 magazines or SLR magazines. They're worth about 300 bucks. Um, ironically, they've gone up because of the register um, mm-hmm. value. So it's worthwhile registering them. And the police are intransigent. They don't have a process for anything that should have been registered by, before the deadline that now it is turning up. And, and it happens all the time. People do alterations to houses and they rip out the walls and go, oh, hello. 
there's a firearm here because people, like I, I know of a collectible Mauser rifle, very rare, that was found inside a wall in a, in a house um, mm. down country. And, uh, and, and that was then, that was before the register came in. But now the police would say, well, that should have been handed back. So it's no, sorry, you can't. Yep. You know, and, and then they're destroying a, a, an antique firearm that's got historical value. Same with the magazine, same with all sorts of stuff. It, it, so how do we fix this? Um, you know, mm. the, the act seemed pretty good until it's had all of these regulations piled on top. You know, I mean, they had, I mean, it's crazy when they brought in the military style semi automatics or E category firearms in the old parlance. Mm -hmm. That was crazy too. If something had a pistol group and now it was a military style semi, semi automatic rifle, it was just insane. These things, right? How do we fix this? Do we, do we amend the existing arms act? Do we do, mm. or do we do what act is suggesting and do a rewrite from the ground up? I think the best thing we can do is. When legislation gets so unclear and so bloated that it's no longer keeping New Zealand safe, which is what we've seen with the current Arms Act, with all the changes that you've outlined and many more that we could talk for days on, I think it's time that we need to start from the ground up and build a modern Arms Act that takes into account all of the firearms that are available today, the technology that is available to support police and licensed firearms owners uh, to keep New Zealand safe, and build one that will last the next 50 years, for example. I was a big believer that New Zealand, even prior to 2019, had the best firearms laws in the world from a perspective of balancing public safety with the right to access firearms for hunting, sport, and collecting. Mm. We're, we're so far past that now. The, the Labour government rushed legislation through, they took in bans, and they've just, they just scrapped good lawmaking based on an emotional um, result. And at this point, Starting from scratch is probably a better uh, way to go about it. How we start that process, I think it's important that, as uh, Minister McKee has said, we need to make sure that everyone is at the table and involved in the discussions, not just the licensed community who are affected directly, but regular New Zealanders as well, because they need to feel protected and comfortable with people owning firearms. We use them for everything from I mean, the number of people who are looking into learning how to hunt because of the cost of living crisis is skyrocketing right now. Yeah. Right? And let alone the Department of Conservation needs hunters to control the out-of-control pest numbers um, yeah. of browsing species, although we don't consider them pests. I'm using their terminology for this. Yeah, right. um, the Department of Conservation considers humans to be pests. Anything that's not native to New Zealand, mate, it's got to go. Yep. But from our perspective, starting from scratch is a good one and making sure that if we're allowing everyone at the table, all ideas are brought forward and considered. So even the ideas of bringing back uh, the E-category firearms, for example, with special license, like a graded license. Well, um, well, that's what I said at the time to Stuart Nash. And I said, you know, this is an easy problem to solve. You know, you're, you're trying to, to crack a nut with a sledgehammer here mm. and it's not going to work. Why don't you just make all semi-automatic A-category firearms E-category and make everybody go through a vetting process to upgrade their security, and that would solve 99% of what you're trying to, trying to do. But they just yep. reject that out of hand. And, and yep. as we've already pointed out, they got X number, X tens of thousands of rifles back, but we know that hundreds of thousands of those rifles were sold. Mm -hmm. So it, it didn't work. I mean, this is the problem I have a lot in politics is mostly you're dealing with stupid people. And, and it sounds crude, but the police are stupid and they come up with stupid solutions to non-problems. A, a good case is the regulations they brought in for transporting firearms and vehicles because mm. somebody might steal one when you stopped at McDonald's and steal your gun out of your car. Well, yep. Nobody ever stopped to say to the police, well, what are the statistics on that? Yeah, How many just to please provide evidence. Yeah, how many guns have been stolen from cars, Ex except from police cars? Let's list. Let's <laughs> yeah, because that's a lot. That number, because that's a lot, right? Take that out. How many? The mm -hmm. answer is almost none. Yep. Right. Another how one was um, die on the roads from from the road toll. Right. Perfect example of this was the section six, which has been in the news. So section six uh, is about the regulations that clubs and rangers have to follow. Yep. Now they said that. 
the, I mean, our opponents now that that's looking to be rev, like lifted and changed and altered to allow more shooting ranges around the country. The opponents of this say, oh, it's going to make New Zealand exponentially more dangerous because they're less regulated. But when you look at the injury numbers, they'd had, not, I think it was the last 20 or 30 years, they'd had 19 injuries on ranges in total. About four of them were at long arm, so rifle ranges, which are still affected by the six and six changes. But 15 of those 19 injuries were highly regulated pistol clubs that were vetted before the change by police. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you really wanted to think about it, you could say that you're most in danger while at a range if you're on a certified range. You'd be safer off at an uncertified one looking at the stats. Mm. But, you know, they, they what wanted was, to be what were the injuries? How many of those injuries were gunshot wounds? Uh, there were a couple of them, but a lot of them <laughs> were... Sprained ankles. <laughs> I think a few of them were actually police or military injuries during their own training events. Yeah. Um, so that should be left out of the recreational one entirely. Um, Colfo put out a really good release on this on our website, which was correcting the claims that were made about clubs and ranges. Um, so if anyone's interested in sort of diving into those details, they're available easily. But that's the thing with police statements, isn't it? They come out with these things to justify an action, right? We're going to clamp down on, we need to register to stop straw buyers. Oh, how many straw buyers have, have there been? Oh, three. There were three recently. Yeah. Not, I mean, although the amount of media coverage of those would make you think there's one every weekend. Are they recycling the same stories? Yeah. Because yeah. because what happens? They do they do the story when they're arrested. They yep. do the story then when they're when they in front court. of jail. Yeah. And yeah, and then they do it when they're sentenced. So they get three hits out of it, and it makes it sound like this is a terrible thing. And and Carhill's big on the straw buyers, but it's a small number of people, and they're criminals anyway. You know, because they're and breaking what, the law. Yeah, and what stops them is not the register or it's any of the, the clubs and ranges changes or increased fees. What stops them is good police work, and that's the only thing that has ever actually stopped criminals from doing harm, catching them and preventing it. And so instead of focusing on license owners, I don't see, especially when the government is really big on cutting costs across government departments, this seems to be the most obvious place to start. Um, so hopefully... The National Party can see some sense in this and actually think... I wouldn't rush it, that. <laughs> it's just quietly. I'm young enough to still be optimistic, however, the longer I play here's in the, the firearm problem. space, the less optimistic I become. Here's the problem, Hugh. The the, the police minister is an ex-policeman. Yes. There, there's your problem right there. Now, what do, you, what do you say to people? I get this all the time, you know. Firearms owning ownership is, a right, is not a right, it's a privilege. Mm. Say to people about that. Yep. So my answer there is it is a responsibility. It's not a right or a privilege. When it comes down to owning a license, it's not given to absolutely anybody. A right would be, you know, the right to free speech can be owned by, like, can yeah, be practiced can. by criminals of your own. Like, we, we understand fundamentally what that is. United States, right? They, they yep. do have a right to bear arms. In, in, yep. in, in their constitution, uh, we don't. No. Nope. So in New Zealand, we don't have a right to bear arms. But we do have a responsibility if you are fit and proper. So if you're a law abiding person that pays their taxes, that has no mental health concern, like no serious mental health concerns, which, again, we'll get to shortly, um, then you should have access to a firearm until a court says you've been convicted of a crime and you're no longer fit and proper. So for basically any New Zealander, regardless of age, race, uh, political beliefs, religious beliefs, if you obey the law and you've never been convicted, then you have the ability to own firearms, to hunt, feed your family, whatever else it is. That's the, our perspective. The police are going along with people who have had a drink driving conviction, maybe mm -hmm. 10 years ago, and yep. going, oh, we're revisiting this, and we don't think you should have your firearms. Correct. And the whole position is the police take everything and make you argue in a court of law, which will usually cost you more tens. money than most people have to actually defend it. Yeah. Um, so again, like the let's say the drunk driving one is uh, one that we we often hear because you're right. In the past, I think that unless the crime is directly related to something that is endangering others intentionally, so let's say domestic violence, absolutely, like no way yep. cut it out. So long as it's gone through a court and it's been proven that isn't just a, an allegation without without actual cause. Um, yeah, violent crimes, no firearms license for you. Sorry, you made your call. Um, but when it comes to, let's say you're a, a teenager or you got drunk when you were 21 and stepped behind the wheel and were caught, 
what relation does or speeding is another one. Let's mm. say you've you've racked up a few speeding fines. Does that mean you're no longer fit and proper to own a firearm? There's no correlation or linkage there to a firearm crime. Now, disclaimer, if you have been hunting, you get drunk while hunting and the guns are in the car when you're arrested for drunk driving. Different game, right? Because the firearm is directly involved in that situation. That would be justifiable. But if there's no link to firearms in the conviction or in the arrest, there shouldn't be a justification there for removing or revoking a firearms license. But the default position with the, of the police is that you're just a criminal looking for somewhere to happen and we're going to catch you and we're just going to stamp on top of you and treat you like scum because that's our default position. And because you are a licensed firearms owner, you are more likely to, I believe, be more heavily punished, made into a headline and made an example of, rather than if you were an unlicensed person going through that, you'd probably be able to plead it down. Yeah. Uh, which is just kind of outrageous as a thought. Like but the idea should be outrageous to everyone. There's so many things that are wrong currently. I mean, I, I recently had a, a, a relicensing, you know, in my license had expired, it's time to relicense. Went through the process. Guy came out to do the inspection and, and interview and the very long and lengthy three hour process that it takes. And at the start of that, he handed me this questionnaire. He said, I'll fill that out. Um, I said, What's that? He said, oh, I just want to see what your knowledge of the Arms Act is. One of the questions in that in that piece of paper was, before you put your firearm away after you finish shooting, what's the first thing that you should do? And then it had A, B, C, D, E, and E of the above. And I chose C, which was ensure the firearm is unloaded. Yep, that's what I'd choose as well. Yep. And he said, no, you got that wrong. Um, you need to redo this. I said, why did I get it wrong? He says, because oh, we want E to be the answer, which is all of the above. I said, it's E isn't a single action. <laughs> what's the first says, what's the first thing that you do? Right? So your comprehension is not not up to speed. So I'm sorry, mm. I'm not doing that. And then when he came in and inspected my safe, he looked in there and he said, and I, and I had four or five shotguns there. You know, I've got a a uh, a trap gun and uh, a sporting phase gun and a whole lot of different shotguns. And he says, oh that's not good. I said, what do you mean? He said, um, well, this guidebook that I've got here says that you have to have the four stock of the shotgun taken off. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll, this, I have a deal, I'll make a deal with you. If you can show me in the law where it says that, mm. I'll take the four stock off the shotgun. If you can't show me in the law where it says that, I'll leave it on. He goes, it's in our guidebook. I said, is it in the law? It's in our guidebook. I said, I don't care if it's in your guidebook. No. Right? Your that guidebook, means your guidebook is wrong. <laughs> your guidebook's wrong, right? And, and he says, oh, well, you know, you're being stroppy. And I said, mm, sounds like you're threatening me now. Yeah, careful, Cam. You're, if you're being stroppy with the arms officer, you might find yourself no longer fit and proper. No, I've got a, I've got a different approach than most people. Is I, I'm loud and, and vocal about my interactions with the police so that they don't take diabolical liberties with me. Mm. I think uh, one of the diabolical things we heard was, oh, it's one of those nightmare ones where an older guy, he was accused of being fit and improper. They turned up to his house and seized all his firearms. He was an old, like an older guy. Yeah. They were caught mocking his disability on his internal CCTV cameras. Oh, yes. um, yeah. Yeah. And like horrendous story. And then guy later died of a heart attack while he was in the process of appealing the license. Yeah. And then the police finally came back and gave the family the guns back. And actually, <laughs> the the funny one we hear a lot is when police find out that they were wrong in seizing a license or anything and give the guns back, they don't say, we're sorry, we made a mistake. They say, don't do it again. Yeah. Which is an outrageous thing because you're giving them back because we were never guilty in the first place. But you're still saying, as though we were and you just couldn't prove it on this occasion, we'll get you next time. I've been involved in a number of court cases um, uh, defending against police action, confiscating firearms. And in, all, in every one of those uh, occurrences, the police manufactured evidence. Mm. They broke the law. And in one case, the judge actually said, well, where's this firearm? You've shown us photographs of it. I want to see for myself. Because a friend of mine gave uh, expert evidence that said that, that this was a Kia gun and not a sawn-off shotgun. Mm. And, and he said because it would have a it has a bead sight on the front of it. 
and uh, and explained you know why and as a as somebody involved in antique arms that what a key gun was and all of that sort of thing. The judge said, "Well, I'd like to see this firearm," and the police couldn't produce it. Mm. They could not produce something that they had confiscated. It was gone. Uh, that's not uncommon. I remember there was a headline after the confiscation event of someone walking into a police station and walking out with a number of firearms, like yep. robbed from the police station. Oh, so it happened down in uh, Palmerston North. Yeah. Walked so when it comes police station and w- walked out with fifteen firearms. Yeah. So when it comes to uh, handling police, I think yeah, well, they they used to be seen as friends of the community, and we ask them for help. Unfortunately, through a, a number of reasons we've talked to um, today, now licensed firearms owners approach police with caution and as though they are going to be treated as criminals. So it's not uncommon to uh, want to record any interactions on your own cell phone, things like that. Internal yep. cameras around wherever you keep your firearms is not also not a bad idea if you can afford it. But it's just making sure that you're you're protected in the same way that they are as well as keeping your own record of your firearms like if they confiscate them from you and you haven't registered yet because you're not required to making sure you keep a photo of each one of them tracking your own serial numbers so that if one of them was to go missing they can't claim that it wasn't it wasn't there yeah or if they end up scratched or damaged because exactly yeah they're not exactly the most a couple of questions for you there might be a bit of a all here, but um, I've got there's a number of people in our club that aren't registering because they believe that uh, the register will cease to exist. Yeah. Right. What's your view on that? Yeah, it's the it's the million dollar. Well, technically, I think the seven million dollar question at this point. Starting with the easy two hundred, one. Two hundred. I don't. Two hundred million. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like eight million dollars a year for the mm. for the, the administration, which is how many police on the street? Side note. When it comes to the easy, the easiest one is the pistol register, always going to be here. And I think probably rightly so. There's a fewer number of them. They're slightly I mean, more dangerous as a relative term, but people are less comfortable with pistols. So that one so will still be there. Same with collectors. Correct. Yeah. So pistols, collectors are probably still there. If E-category firearms or semi-automatic centerfires come back in, I'd expect those ones to be registered as well. Um, yep. under the higher restrictions. So the big question is a category firearms. Um, that is everyone's uh, hunting rifles, sporting shotguns, those and the like. My gut feel is that the National Party, given that they have a police minister, are pretty desperate to see that one stay. The ACT Party are pretty comfortable with it being removed so long as the evidence that's provided when the law changes come around as part of the new Arms Act rewrite if the evidence stacks up for removing it, then I believe it will be removed. Now, from our perspective, there's no question the evidence will stack up that it doesn't make sense because it hasn't anywhere in the world and it won't magically just work for New Zealand because of some unknown reason or because gun control New Zealand think it'll work. Mm. So that being said, changing the law takes a long time. Uh, I believe ACT want to get it done in one term of government. So the Arms Act rewrite, it's been on the cards for a while. I know Nicole has been putting in work to consult with experts, although she's, it's funny, um, recently they were accused of being non-transparent because they went out to only a select number of people for um, reviewing the Section 6 Arms Act. Mm. What was neglected by Cahill at the police union, as well as Gun Control New Zealand, was that that was not even the public consultation process. That was the pre-paper before they put yeah. anything together to make sure it was an expert piece. I'm like, so we're actually being more transparent than previous governments ever were, and yet they're being accused of being anti-transparent because one of the things I believe from GCNZ's perspective is when you have a government that is actually committed to listening to the evidence and being experts before setting law, and they haven't just got a compliant people who go along with whatever the trend is, Gun control New Zealand suddenly feel that they're being objectified or they're not being listened to. And my answer then was like, well, welcome to being a licensed firearms owner for the last like five, six years. Like now you know why we were complaining, but you told us to shut up and take it. So in this case, we're not even telling them to shut up. We're saying, you know what? Contribute, be an equal part of society and have just as much say, despite the fact their membership, I think is less than a hundred people. It might even be in the thirties. So why they have so much control in so many people's ear is ridiculous. Yeah. It's um it's news by press release. 
Yeah. yeah. Your view is similar to mine. Right? I, I believe that a gun, gun register will exist, particularly for pistols, uh, restricted firearms, uh, collectors, uh, and prohibited firearms. And mm-hmm. maybe it'll be extended to E category so that people who belong to pistol clubs can uh, compete in competitions. But yeah. that, that'll be it. Now, here's a really curly one. I saw this uh, on the weekend. Uh, a guy who was trying to buy a firearm, and um, he was asked for his firearms license. And he said, I don't have my firearms license on me, but I have a photograph of it on my phone. Will, mm. you, will you accept that? Now, yep. I, know my, I know what my feeling is on that. that that's no. Yep, my, my feeling is exactly the same as yours. I wouldn't be allowed to enter or leave the country with a photo of my passport. So... Correct or even purchase alcohol with a photo of my license. So yeah. produce their physical card or sorry, don't buy the gun now, go home, get it and come back. Yep. And that's where we, why as shooters, when we see something, we need to say something. If someone's yep. being stupid, we need to a tell them they're being stupid and then tell somebody else. Yes. Yeah. Because it is, I mean, part of the the reason joining uh, shooting clubs and being part of the community is important is because we can do exactly that. We self-police really well. Mm. Um, If someone is an issue, it's more likely to be identified by people who say, I mean, you'll never be, you'll never see a place that takes safety around firearms more seriously than on a gun club. Like, yeah, you you flag someone, you are off the range reported incident reports logged. Like, but same time. So, I mean, we've recently been discussing around when we look at the new arms act and what could be brought in instead of the register, like how do we make New Zealand safer? What proactive things that we can do? Well, we could ask um, the police to follow the law. That, that might be a good start for public safety. That would definitely help as well as actually taking, uh, taking the people who commit crimes using firearms off the streets and not allowing them to blade down, but from a firearms community so that we can be seen to be coming to the table with something fresh um, we know that pistol clubs have sort of compulsory membership to a club. Mandatory attendance, I don't like for every every owner of a firearms. But let's say we have the staggered licensing process in a similar way we have a beginner's restricted and full driver's licenses. If you're a new person, just 16 or whatever age you are, getting your firearms license for the first time, maybe you have to be a compulsory member of a club so that you can be around people who know how to use firearms safety safely they can imbue those in you and you can sort of get that culture of safety before you go off on your own attend then later on safety briefings attend safety courses all of those sorts of things exactly and the idea that you can get a firearms license in New Zealand through only reading a book and not setting any practical level i think is a really interesting one imagine mm-hmm. getting a driver's license having only read the safe the road code but never driving a car so i think that physical um, range handling, a very basic one, should be a compulsory part of getting a license. Yeah, because we talk, if we talk about it from public safety point of view, right? We we have about six or seven hundred people die on our roads every year, right? It's mm-hmm. a road call. Well, we don't take people's cars off them. No, right? we don't. Oh. Um, we, if someone's an alcoholic, we take their car off them. Uh, or don't take the car off them. We take their license off them temporarily. Right? And if you're if someone else goes speeding. We don't restrict V8 cars to say, you know what, nothing that goes over 100k an hour. Because why? Why would you need a car that goes over 100 kilometers? The speed limit's 100. Yeah, but we've accepted that there is going to be a road toll. That there is a mm-hmm. risk to driving, and sometimes that risk involves death and injury. Yeah, but the police's default position with firearms is that we don't want any risk, and so they want to have heaps and heaps of restrictions so that you actually can't use your firearms at all. Just about. And yeah. I'm pretty sure that the police don't actually want firearms in New Zealand at all. Having spoken to a couple of officers, um, some sworn and still serving others who have left the department for various reasons, there is more of an attitude that is, I mean, it'll be top down. It's hard to, it's hard to deny the changes in police attitudes since 2019. Mm. But then there's also issues like the Constable Hunt situation, like that fatal shooting of a police officer. It's yeah. understandable why they would not want the public or specifically criminals to be using guns because it puts their officers in danger, completely understand that. But when it comes to licensed firearms owners who have passed all the safety tests and things, we're not the ones shooting at officers. No. Like we're not the ones who are putting them at risk. The fact that they are now fearful of us. It's a very small number. The fact that they feel so afraid of us that they must come to our house armed and vested up is, I think, 
a real sad state of affairs around not only the the licensed firearms owners trust and confidence in police but also in their own like the fact that they view us in that way is it's not a good thing for society well here we've come up against time now so mm. we've had a good traverse of a lot of the issues that many people out there who are thinking about uh, you know obtaining a firearms license or, or wanting to get interested in will at least give them some thought about that and I dispelled a few myths that are being put out in, in the rest of the media about firearms. So I really appreciate your time coming on the show. No, I appreciate it too. And I think despite the doom and gloom that we've got going on, there's, I think the final thing is, as we look at this Arms Act being put forward, the most important thing any of us can do now is actually make our submissions written or oral if you're comfortable when they ask for public consultation. Because yeah. we 100% know the gun control New Zealands and those who are anti-firearms will be out there in mass trying to change everything to make it more difficult for licensed firearms owners. And we need our community probably for the first time to come out in force and say, look, we want good gun laws that keep safe, but we need to actually write that. And for the first time, we have a government that's willing to listen to that process. The previous ones were very sort of, I mean, they were a bit of a joke, to be fair, their consultation. And so it's easy to be dismissive of the process. Now we actually need to back it because if we do this right over the next two years, we'll set ourselves up for success over the next 50. Yeah, and Reality Check Radio listeners know the power of submitting to particular bills. We, we've managed to get through a lot of changes, uh, You mm. know, most Im importantly around the COVID inquiry. But I would say that owning firearms and being able to hunt and gather food for yourself is actually a freedom issue. Yep. And and the more that the community embraces yeah. firearms and the more that they do this, the the better off it will be for everybody. Join clubs, uh, participate in events and social events and everything else, and and learn to to enjoy the benefits that come from firearms ownership. Yeah, it's like it's it's a great sport. It's a good way to feed your family as well. And we we need more hunters and shooters, especially young ones coming through. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you and look forward to it in future. You're welcome here on the show at any time. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see, not everything you hear in legacy media from police or politicians about firearms is true or even honest. The firearms community, like the freedom community, has been victimised, denigrated and maligned for far too long by both police and politicians. It's time we had sensible gun laws rather than emotional laws that have demonstrably failed. Tell me what you think about that discussion with Hugh Devereaux Mac. Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio. Now it's time for Cam's Buddies. This week, we'll find out what they think about the Darlene Tana and Green Party issues. We heard what Matt McCartan thought. Let's see what the buddies think. My producer has them all lined up and ready to go. Let's go now to Cam's Buddies. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Lindley. Good to have you back. Oh, hi, Cam. Yes. It's good to have you there too. Ah, yes. Well, well, you know, can't do without me. <laughs> No, it's a highlight of my week. <laughs> so, you know, what's going on with the Greens? What are your thoughts on the – I'm more interested in the Greens rather than the individual people like Darlene Tarner or Golrez Garriman. There seems to me to be an issue in the Greens. What do you reckon? Well, um, there's four words they've never heard of, and mm. they are accountability, integrity, honesty and decency. They know all about and, hypocrisy, though, don't they? Pardon? They know all about hypocrisy. They know that word. Well, I don't think they do know it. They don't even realise um, that it exists, do they? Uh, I mean, they practice it, yes. Mm. But do they realise they're practising it? But I think you're right, you know. If you think back to the Green Party of old with Jeanette Fitzsimons and Rod Donald, I think they had integrity and I think they had honesty and they were earnest about what they believed. But this lot, they seem to be all over the place. I mean, they're great at protesting and they're great at sloganeering, 
But when it comes to actually being decent human beings, they seem to be a bit uh, lacking. No, well, I think they're the modern day um, element that have crept into politics, actually. They are motivated by greed. <clears throat> and this last case is a man manipulation of uh, immigrants and cheating the system. Uh, I can't think of a worse example of how uh, politics should be, to be honest. Um, we've had the shoplifting case. We've had that um, pushed under the guise of mental health, health. Yep. Um, which I'm not sure whether it is or not, but it certainly seems an extraordinary thing to do, to just go around shoplifting high-end um, clothing. Just... We, we've also had uh, James Shaw, you know, I mean, he, he couldn't even get his um, online profile correct, and he... For a long time, he left it there. He said he had a BA, BA from Victoria University. Yeah, um, he said he had a bugger all, but he actually had and never did. Exactly. Hmm. And um, then we've got two members who I have to carefully say appear to be, have been involved with the shoplifting case. Yep. And you and I both know who they were. Well, you know, so some... um, I just think there's just absolutely no ethics whatsoever. It's rather like the militant activists behind the Maori Party. They are sort of tarred with the same brush. They're in there for greed, enriching themselves, not helping their own people at all. And um, can I just quote you the Green Party statement on, mm. on their um, website? Sure. Meet our, meet our MPs who are hard at work fighting for people and planet. Now, does that fit what we're experiencing? Well, you know, um, I guess Golrius Garriman was working hard to pinch other people's hard work. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure Darlene Tana was working hard to enrich their family by exploiting migrant workers, uh, allegedly. She was. Mm. But and of course, she in the planet. No. And like you say, those original ones uh, in the Green Party, they sort of capitalised on people's emotions for the planet and for people. Um, and I think they did sort of start off in that vein, <clears throat> but they're certainly a long way from it today. Well, I mean, yeah. they're actually an absolute joke. And if we only were allowed to have political satire again, you can imagine um, you can imagine the skits on, on them. Mm. I mean, you know, it's often said by people with a bit, bit tongue-in-cheek, but it's probably pertinent, um, that uh, the Greens put the mental into environmental. <laughs> yes, well... That would be right, wouldn't it? I can remember having a discussion with James Shaw once um, outside TV3's um, headquarters one morning and I'd just been on TV and he was due to come in and I said to him, you know what, I should be a Green Party voter. He says, why is that? He says, you wouldn't be a Green Party person, Cam. I said, look, we all want the same things. I, you know, I'm a hunter. Um, I'm in the bush a lot. I want, you know, pristine bush. I want clean water. Uh, I like going to the beach. I want to see the ability for everybody to have access to beaches and, and the, the water there is clean and not polluted. I want all of these things, but what I don't want is all of the taxes that you want to keep um, slamming people with, which, by the way, won't uh, clean up any of those things. And I don't want your communism um, policies that uh, take from everyone who's worked hard and give it to those who don't work at all. And, and he said, oh, well, I guess we have to agree to disagree and then went inside. And that was the, the, the extent of the discussion. But I thought, you know, they're missing the point here. There are a vast number of people like me who want all of these things. We all want the same things. Nobody wants polluted water. Nobody wants, you know, forests being cut down. We don't want those things. But they can't attract people like me to them because of the the crazies, as I said, the mental and the environmental. Well, 
I just think they're total hypocrites, I'm sorry to say. Um, and if you went out hunting, um, they wouldn't want you actually shooting uh, any venison and bringing that home. So that one would be out the door. Yep. Um, but um, I was quite interested in the um, Darlene Tana case in that, because <clears throat> I did read it, Oh, it must be six or eight weeks ago they had the case or investigation of it and actually stuff actually had it online. Mm. So I'd have to give them a very rare bit of praise, actually, for doing that. Um, but it was sort of around, mainly around these um, immigrant workers. and But nobody mentioned, um, when, when she paid them in cash, nobody's mentioned yet about, what about... Um, Income tax, what about holiday pay and health and safety compliance and all that stuff that other um, business owners, you know, have to abide by? What about all of that? And I understand that um, she, well, it looks like she's claimed essential workers government subsidy during the COVID as well. Mm. Um, mm. Now, all of these things, they're, they're all the rottenest crimes against humanity that you can have in New Zealand, in it's my as, opinion. Rotten is a weak old chicken leg, isn't it? Terrible. Mm. Absolutely terrible to take advantage of people coming into New Zealand on visas and or different visas from what she hired them for. And then the other thing is, um, isn't she the green spokesperson for small business? I'm not sure if she is or um, El, El Woco Loco, the Mexican bandit, um, is the is the person who's responsible for that. I'm not sure. But, I mean, any business that involves no. policies is going to be a small business anyway, isn't it? I mean, there's no profit. Yeah, in, well, it's just that I can, I can remember way back to when that was online and I remember – well, I think I remember um, that she was named as, as the spokesperson for small business because at the time I thought, how extraordinary, and here she is, um, donkey deep in her husband's business and ripping people off. And, um, Allegedly. You know, what's going to happen with her? Shouldn't she, shouldn't she be charged with something? Well, I mean, I guess uh, that's up to... Um I guess that's up to up to the authorities. I mean, I, I guess immigration will be looking at these cases. But, you know, earlier I spoke to Matt McCartan and he said to me, what's damning is not all the allegations, it's the fact that not a single person from the Waiheke community has come out and said, Dar uh, Darlene Tan is an awesome person. Uh, she's a wonderful advocate for us. And uh, we'd like to see her stay as an MP. He says that's damning that the local community has remained utterly silent on Darlene Tanner and yeah. the elections. Yes, well, she she may have more influence there than we know about. Of course, there are such things as leverage. Well, yeah, it's, Waiheke's a small place, and everybody knows everybody. Oh, it's very. I mean, there's only about eight thousand people who live there permanently. And everybody knows everybody, and they all know each other's business. But, um, you know, you, they're very quick to support people or whatever. But, you know, I've got a few contacts in Waiheke, and they're telling me that it's been well known for a long time in the community that, you, that they take advantage of migrant workers um, and also youth workers. Um, and I know, I know of one youth worker who uh, was paid well under the minimum wage and told to shut up uh, when it came to, to, to any of that. Well, no, I mean, that's absolutely disgraceful. It's, it's really a sanitised form of slavery, really. Well, I just looked up the parliamentary website uh, for, for Darling Tana because she's still listed there, um, and her spokesperson roles were digitising government, internal affairs, Media and Communications, Oceans and Fisheries, Overseas New Zealanders and Science, Innovation and Technology. So no small business. No. Well, obviously, either I've read that wrong or, or it was reported wrong, one or the other. Um, but anyway, she's got heap, heaps of uh, tasks there that she should be paying attention to, not, not running her husband's uh, bike business. 
Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really make sense that she would say she knew nothing about the way the business was run because there was a husband and wife team and she didn't know everything about the business was run, how the business was run. And, and Steve Gilgallan, that stuff, I mean, one of the probably one of the best uh, investigative journalists in New Zealand, even though he works for that ragged stuff. Uh, he he got quotes from people that they were negotiating with with uh, Darlene Tana and she was paying them in cash and all of those sorts of things. So she she's donkey deep in it all for sure, and there needs to be oh, some absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as I recall of that original investigation, um, the the uh, migrants they were well. She's treated them like halfwits. Um, because I think they were Argentinian from memory. Um, but yeah. what she didn't realise is that they've actually taped her. If you go back to that original inquiry from that journalist you're talking about, they taped her on their smartphones every conversation just about. Yep. So she's really backed into a corner if she's going to be charged, that is. I mean, these MPs, they seem able to completely escape uh, justice. She's not accountable at all, and I think it's a disease through um, politics at the moment. Yep, unaccountability of politicians and elites, and we see that in the way that they're treated. Anyway, uh, mm. Lindley, I've got another call lined up behind you, so I better take that. Thank you so much for calling into Cam's Buddies, and we'll talk again next week. Yeah, lovely to hear from you, Cam. See you later. Bye bye. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Paul. Good to have you back. Thank you for having me. How are you this day? I'm fantastic, thank you. As I always am, you know the rules around asking questions like that. I do indeed. Yeah. So I'll go with hello. <laughs> Uh, the question I've got for you, or the issue I've got for you today, is what on earth is going on inside the Green Party as an organisation and the Darlene Tana revelations of migrant exploitation uh, and, and all the shenanigans around that, what your thoughts are as, as a former employer or a current employer of, of people? What do you think about all this? Well, I think it's quite interesting that if someone's been hired or they've got a visa that says that they're a fruit picker mm. and then they don't have any work as a fruit picker, what do they have? So so why is it that they don't have work as a fruit picker? And so if, if um, Darlene has said, okay, you've got no work at that, maybe you could work for me in the bicycle shop. Now, um, if that's what's happened, everybody talks about exploitation of immigrants. Well, well, what does that mean? Who mm. said it's exploitation? Could it be helping the immigrants who have had a, a promise of a job, but the job has failed to materialise? And then when they're saying, well, we're not sure what we can do here, and she says, oh, well, my husband's got a business, we could try out on something like this. Mm. That's very charitable, I realise. But that sort of thing has happened to a number of people that I know. And if the contract for picking has finished sooner than they thought or for some reason the cops were different, were ready at a different time or whatever, and they've come with some other thing that's very interesting. So so lots of these stories have more than one slant, but the fact that the Greens have no problem defending the likes of an absolute thief and then throw under the bus someone who's actually um, been a director, sure, but she finished being a director of that company um, more than a year ago, mm. and then her husband may or may not have done different things, and and to be to be sort of um, tarred with the same brush as your as your husband, regardless. Like many, if I talk to many of my friends, their wives aren't actually sure what their business does. It's still their wives, and maybe they should find out. Don't know. So I think there could be more to the story than meets the eye. And then I see that she's got a, convict, a, a, um, a prosecution pending and the Greens took her to the police for not having a sponsor on an ad or a campaign ad. And I'm mm. thinking, well, now that's got a different aroma to it. So they really want her gone and they're threatening her with, well, we'll take criminal proceedings against you for something that whilst it's wrong, if that's the first electoral fraud crime we've seen, we haven't been around much. 
Yeah, well, so that's... I'm thinking, wow, they're actually really never going having a having a go at her now. If I was her, I'd dig in and say, give me some of that free public money, and I'll stay here for three years and just milk it dry. Well, that's what it looks like is going to happen. But I think you're right. There is more to this than meets the eye. I mean, I've got sources that are telling me that uh, the the migrant exploitation stories uh, do have some. Uh, element of truth to them, but there's a lot uh, that's been missed out. And it looks like, exactly as you say, a a fit-up job for the Greens that have decided the face doesn't fit or or they they perhaps don't get on with her, so let's use this to chuck her under the bus. Um, And, and, you know, they're, they're also cornered themselves, though, because they've opposed vociferously over many, many years the Walker jumping bill, and so that's why you saw them on Monday night uh, begging, you know, it looked quite pathetic actually, begging for her to resign. And and she basically flipped the middle finger at them and said, uh, this isn't right, uh, I'm digging in and stopping. So I think we've got a whole lot more entertainment to come and a whole lot more revelations to come. You see, I, I know that in the political scene, there's always another turn to the story. They sell it one way, but when the media says safe and effective, and I know, well, that's not necessarily true. When they say this is the podium of truth, I think, yeah, well, I'm not sure that's true either. When they say um, Russia, 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 overseas media, I'm not sure that's true. And so now they're saying, here's a woman exploiting migrants. Well, really? Well, tell us what she did. I oh, gave them a job. Now, now it says there that some of them didn't get paid, and I get that. If they are not expecting pay on Thursday and they don't get it till Friday, they didn't get paid. Or you know, there's a whole. You can make these stories sound really bad without getting information at at hand. Now, I think it couldn't happen to a nicer group because I think um, a lot of what they get into Parliament on is BS, and uh, they've got. Do you know anybody that doesn't want the planet as nice as possible? Because I don't. Do you know anybody that doesn't want a a really green, clean air and and a a clean um, waterway? I don't know anybody that doesn't want that. So they talk like they're the only ones that want it. Well, what they really are is they're they're, um, completely commo in the middle. They want to give away everybody else's money as fast as they can and let's have taxes for this and taxes for that, and we could have free dental care if we tax the rich. That's not free dental care. That's the rich paying for your dental care. And then why would they pay the dental care? The, the people that have got the money have taken risks and done all sorts of things to get to where they want to go. But the Greens are the lot that say, no, we'll take as much of that as you can until it's almost not worth being in business, and that'll learn you. Well, I think with some stories like that, maybe there's more to this story about Darlene Tana than meets the eye. Well, you know, I just said to Lindley before that um, the Green Party puts the mental into environmental. <laughs> I hear you. That's a very good line. But, um, you know, I spoke to Matt McCartan uh, uh, earlier in the show, and um, and he, he said to me uh, something that was quite interesting, saying, uh, you know, that... Uh, there is seems to be a systemic problem in the Green Party where, uh, and, and he believes that their processes for selection of candidates are dreadful, and they end up with these uh, shrill uh, protest-type people who have no abilities in any way, shape, or form for anything else, uh, who posture, uh, preen themselves, think that they're all that in a bag of chips, uh, and have a sanctimonious air about them, that, that they can do no wrong and then get all indignant when you point out some of the flaws in their uh, thinking uh, and and then uh, continue to bellow and, and carry on with no actual depth or any sort of human resources management or people management or anything like that. And, and that's what Winston said last week too. He said he thinks that you know, Golrez Garriman was clearly in, in had issues uh, that would have been obvious to the Green Party, but they did nothing about it. And uh, that's not the way uh, a political party should act. And you and I both know an, an MP who uh, who was chucked under the bus by his own party in a similar fashion. And when you hear the other side mm. of the story, it's a whole lot different, isn't it? 
when you're in a meeting with someone and they're saying really um, things that you just can't you just can't have go public, true or not true. You just can't have them. They're just absolutely character damning things. And they're saying we can get people that will um, testify to this, true or not. And you think, wow, that, that's pretty interesting. But but back to um, the Greens. What they've got is they seem to reward whoever is the loudest protester or whoever is the, the loudest and most risque at their um, what they're prepared to do in a form of protest rather than who's got the most brains and has got a, a, something to offer that the New Zealand public are looking for rather than just, like, what are they for? They're against everything, but what are they for? Um, yeah, I'm not sure on that. You know, that, that's the thing. So let's that... get rid of fossil fuels so that, because people die of cold rather than heat. Mm. And they're saying, oh, the tidal rise, this will happen, this will happen, the, the climate change, climate change. And, and you look and you think, we're spending a trillion dollars. If we spent it on technology to make bigger walls that will stop the tide coming in, we could do that with trillions of dollars. Well, the, like, man the has been able to work away around every problem. Yeah, the Dutch have been doing it for centuries. It's not that difficult. Exactly. Yeah. But, uh, you know... I just I struggle to see what their point is. You know, they go, "Oh, mm. Dan has done some things that are uh, not don't fit with the Green Party." Well, well, why didn't you check that out before she became an MP? You know, I, I know the yeah, National Party do- has selection processes. I know the Labor Party has selection processes where they ask them to disclose things, and then they go and dig into their background, and they have people in teams that actually go and rattle a few cages, and some some people never make it past pre-selection because there's too much rubbish in their past. But the Greens don't seem yes. to have it. Well, what, what they seem to have is, um, like, all, all the things that she's meant to have done wrong happened before they came into government. So clearly it wasn't like she did it subsequently. It was done prior. Yep. And they just throw them under the bus with political expediency. This is the thing. I mean, you got to see it yourself, uh, the the uh, duplicitousness of political parties when they want to get their own way. They're quite prepared to literally throw people in front of trains. Um, but <laughs> this, this is what the Green Party's doing right now. They, they, they've decided that Darling Turner doesn't fit. And so it looks like... And we and we don't know because we haven't seen the report, even though the taxpayers paid for it. We don't know what the substance is of those allegations. They're only allegations, and it could be a case of he said, she said. Mm. But what's interesting is that you and I paid for that in um, what is it, the Greens Party, um, the, the the leader of the party sort of stipend that she's got to spend money on anything she wants. But that's taxpayer money. It's not green money. It's it's taxpayers' money. And then, oh, yeah, we might show you the full one day. Yeah, good day. Yeah. Nice for some. Yeah, and, and at the same time, they've been bellowing about the National Party not producing the Sam Uffendall report. You know, you'd constantly see the Green Party talking about that. Where's the report on that? Well, well, the same can go the other way. It just seems that the Green Party is, you know, shielded with um, a shield of sanctimony and wrap themselves up in a cloak of hypocrisy when it suits. Yep, and the media don't challenge them hardly at all, well, which all... always amazes me. I mean, if you look at people like, um, uh, you know, the the guy on One News, um, little little upstart with an affected voice, and you know, John Campbell. Sorry, it is. Oh, he's, he's, not, so... he's on three, I thought. Well, he, he used to be on three. He's on one now. Um, right. He he's a sanctimonious Green Party supporter. You, know, you saw him give an interview um, uh, with Golrez Garriman. That was like a big cuddle for, for like half an hour. Yeah, I've come up with really soft effort questions and, oh, you aren't even a very good thief. Well, yeah. that, how do you know that? You didn't bolt with 50 dresses previously and this is the last two. Yeah, exactly. And that's what Matt McCartan said. He said, what, I can't believe that they're letting you get away with excuses like, I, I felt like I wanted to get caught or I wanted to um, quit mm-hmm. Parliament and this was the way to do it. And he said, in my world, 
you don't want to be there anymore. You just say, I'm resigning because of family reasons, goodbye, and walk out the door. Yeah, it doesn't seem that harsh. Not harsh at all. All right, Paul, thanks for your views on Darlene Tana and the Green Party, and we'll talk again next week. All good. Thanks, Cam. Bye for now. Thanks, Paul. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Jimmy. Good to have you back. G'day, Cam. How are you this week? Yeah, fantastic, mate. Always fantastic. And what's your topic this week, mate? Well, all the news is about Darlene Tyler and the Green Party, but uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on whether or not the problem is with their MPs or the problem is with the party or a little bit of both. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> um, I think a lot of it is their selection process is um, selecting people on their race and um, other characteristics rather than actual merit. You end up with a bunch of duds that meet all sorts of quotas. Do you think that's maybe, relevant? Maybe DEI stands for duds, idiots, and idiots. <laughs> well, how do you explain a party that just loses so many? I mean, National got heaps of hassle from the media a few years ago when you know they lost. Was it the Southland MP, and then they lost Jamie Lee Ross, or yeah, I don't know which order it was? You in a quick. Succession, and everyone was saying, "Oh, what's the problem with the National Party? Do they have a problem with their selection processes? Well, all, of, yeah. all of those sorts of things." But it seems with the Greens, the media gives them a free pass. Maybe they're just as hypocritical as the Green Party are. Exactly, they give them rehabilitation. They give them soft stories in prime time. Yeah, it's like John Campbell a half-hour cuddle session yeah, with Gary exactly. Garriman. Yeah, exactly. The, the Green Party is just not a Green Party at all. It's it's a basically communist party. I mean, if you think back to the party of Rod Donald and Jeanette for Simons, it's not even close to that. Well, they were genuine it's, people it's with just, beliefs, you know, and you could trust them. I wouldn't trust this Green Mob with anything. I wouldn't trust them to run a bath. No, I mean, the, the, Jeanette Fitzsimons was genu genuinely a really lovely person, and but she was a compost person. She, you know, she was literally into the environment. Mm. And But I, how come it's attracted all these self like, I see the next on the list is the self-declared communist. Mm. Well, I've seen I mean, it everybody, you know, um, the Green Party putting mental into environmental. <laughs> Quite apt, but what's astonishing is their support stays rock solid, fifteen-ish. You know, other parties do dip and go up and down on a bad performance, but not the Greens. You know what that they is? Just don't that people don't care? That's women voters in the leafy suburbs who think that the Green Party are all about the planet, uh, without bothering to actually in investigate, you know, uh, the their true policies, which are all communist. I mean, uh, a few years ago, um, David Farrah did an assessment of their website on all the things that they want to ban, and there was something like 200 or 300 things they want to ban, but there was nothing that they were for other than higher taxes. Oh, my God, it's just so depressing. <laughs> you, just, you can't tax your way to prosperity, eh? Yeah, you can't. The, you, um, can't you can't tax your way to prosperity. I did see a, a thing that said that women are between 18 and 49, if a woman only voted, we would have a Green Prime Minister. Mm. So it, it really is. Scary, a, isn't it? it really is, eh? But on the other hand, if you had men over 50 to 75 or something, it would be an Act Prime Minister. So I guess they could say that's equally as scary. Well, I think but, that the problem we have is uh, for basically uh, two and three quarters of a year, uh, voters just don't care what's going on. They're not engaged. They don't bother to have a look. And then we have an election campaign. In the last six weeks, people sort of sit up and take notice and then go, oh, oh that's the Green Party. Oh, they're, they're for the environment, aren't they? Oh, I'll vote for them. But like Paul said earlier in the show, you know, he doesn't know anybody who doesn't want clean water and clean beaches and, and pristine bush and all of those things. We all want the same things. But he said, uh, it's all the other things that the Greens have that are, that are frightening. That no, they don't seem to take into consideration. Well, they have no way or idea or way to generate wealth or generate productivity. That, that's what actually makes us rich. 
that sort of make us be able to afford publicised healthcare and publicised education and so on. There's no other solution to get money except tax. That's it. But you can't tax our income. So if you kill the economy and everyone with money leaves, there's literally no money. The tax does nothing. You have nothing. What's the, but so, you know, I see the anti Shane Jones big time now, you know, because Shane's actually proposing some mining, which we need to do yeah. to stay wealthy. We can't just mine in poor countries and not mine in ours. We're, you know, it's, it's insane. Anyway, well, no, the, the, he's like, electric cars in you know, we've, got that, we've got to have all the electric cars with that cobalt that are picked out of dirty holes in the ground by small African children, that's okay because it's over there. We don't need to worry about that. And we can... Yeah, there's no labour laws, there's no environmental laws, there's no carbon capture laws, nothing. But that's fine. Yep, it's not in our, our backyard. Dig out lithium from Mongolians and using small, you know, Asian children to dig in the holes for that. That's okay. That's over there. We can't see it. It's fine. You know, we can drive around in a cloud of smug in our and our Teslas and our, you know, Nissan Leafs, and we can be smug and we can say that we're, we're better than anybody else. Can't they get a bit of sense and say, well, we're going to let you mine, but we want strict environmental controls and negotiate some real heavy royalties or whatever to reinstate it or, or you know, whatever, We've underground got, mine. Got, it or... got those laws. That's the thing. We've already got things like that. But, you know, I mean, have you ever been to Northern Territory um, and driven past the Jabiru mine. I, no, I heard. No, right? yeah. It's a uranium mine in Northern Territory, right? And the Greens always yeah. bang on about, oh, you know, it's a hole in the ground, it's terrible. You can drive past it on the main road and you wouldn't know the mine was there. You can't even see it. Is it ginormous, though? It's, a, it's enormous, but so is Northern Territory. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, the, Australia is fortunate in that sense that their backyard is empty and just flat dust, right? We we do have a lot of bush, and so it's yeah. But where is Shane Jones? A lot more bush than we want. As Shane Jones said last week, you know, we've got you know millions of hectares of um, of uh, of forest in New Zealand, and we want to use a couple of hundred hectares to create some mines, like get a grip. And he's right. No, I completely agree. I mean, the Denniston mine is starting to reinstate now, and I've had a look at that. You know, mm. bits of bush that they'd previously dug up, there's planting programs in place, and in 20, 30, 40 years, it'll all be back to normal, but we've extracted all the coal out of it, you know? Yeah, totally. So I think the Greens have got a lot to answer for it. They're just making people poorer. They're just communists, mate. They need to be called out. We need a better media. We need the media that's going to call them out. We actually need Ask some actual hard questions. Ask Chloe Swarbrick how she proposes to actually create wealth besides taxing. You know, until until that happens, we're just going to have ideal of people voting for them. Mm. You know? It just goes on, Cam, and probably the next generation of Greens will be worse because if you look at it from when... Did the Green Party start in the 90s? Uh, no, it's been around since the seventies in various different guises. They used to be called the value, <clears throat> the values party. Yeah, yeah, but this this version of it, the green party. Yeah, it kind of started anyway, in the nineties. In the nineties, right? Mm. But you know, even Ru- Russell Norman isn't as bad as this lot, right? And it's just continually getting worse. So imagine in another ten years, that, you know, that we just mind blowing. Until we force them to change their name and stop stealing a good marketing campaign. Well, that's why that's going to be. In, they're going to be in government. That's what Matt McCartan said earlier in the show. He said uh, the Green Party carries on going because they've got a cool colour scheme. <laughs> and but the, the the good thing is that whoever's the leader of the Labour Party, whether it's Chris Hipkins or whoever, they have to go into government with the Greens. Yeah. So. They have to force them to be moderate, it's, and it's going to cause big problems. Like there's, the left is always going to melt down because the whereas the right are a lot more pragmatic. Like National will always have to go with ACT or Winston, and they can sort of put aside the differences and get on with the gains, whereas the left just can't. And so, if you get Labor, you're going to get the Greens, and that's unavoidable. And you're going to get the Greens. And it's, well. Well, exactly, at the moment, but, you know, 
over the next five or ten years, who knows whether they'll survive. But yeah, so I, I quite like that. That people, I think that the right will go into the big campaign saying that a vote for Labor is a vote for the Greens, and you know that's pretty scary to your average Kiwi. Totally. Totally. All right. Okay. All right. Anyway. Thank you for your comments on that, and we'll talk again next week, eh? Thanks, mate. Cheers. Okay, mate. See you. You can always rely on my buddies for truth bombs, and we certainly heard some there about the sagas going on inside the Greens. You have to wonder whether or not the mainstream media bothers to actually speak to people and understand what's going on. Tell us your thoughts on Cam's buddies by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Committed to fair debate and honest information, the Reality Check has arrived. RCR, Reality Check Radio. And now it's time for the whale bag. Some general feedback. Kingsley has raised a question for myself and political commentators. He says, your view of the US political sideshow is exactly like TV3, red versus blue. No mention whatsoever of Kennedy. His debate on X was connected to the CNN one, and it got more views. He is a real option and will only benefit from the screw-ups at the DNC, to say nothing of people's hatred of Trump. Well, Kingsley, I put that question to Matt McCartan in the show this week, and you might uh, find his response interesting. Uh, he interestingly also has the same response that I do about Kennedy. And the reality is, is that ideal and reality, not hopium. So Kennedy is not the real deal. And the American system has never elected a third party candidate and is unlikely to in the foreseeable future. Beth says, another cracking show, Cam. I love the Sunday, so playing their song was a great choice. A comment about Winston Peters that has come from Mike from Foxton. Hi, Cam. Your recent interview with Mr. Peters was a bit too soft for my liking. I think RCR listeners want to hear more from Winston than just talking about the old days. After all, you're a journalist, Cam. Where were the real questions about what is happening? We know you know Winston well, but the matey-matey approach doesn't really make for interesting journalism. We have a crew on RCR that talk media matters already. That is all you did, and basically tell Winston how wonderful he is. And yes, we do know it's important to keep encouraging Winston and New Zealand first when they're doing the right thing, but you're the one who said, look at what the Argentinian president did in 100 days. Well, look at the glacial rate of things happening here, and it's important to ask why some things are taking so long. You have brilliant ideas, re the sacking of heads of departments and the executive, so why are you not pushing for that sort of thing? Why? Is Tea Party Maori being tolerated with all their racial slurs and racist rhetoric? Come on, Cam, you're way better than this. Get back to what you used to do and get some real issues on the table with these politicians. I'd like you to ask him, for example, why is the government still pushing gene therapy jabs? Why is the education minister not stood up and stopped the nonsense about transgender toilets and schools being an issue? And why has she not removed the transgender relationship guidelines in schools and what is happening with Marsden Point and the glacially slow progress there? I want New Zealand First to do well, but I do understand that they are the smallest party, so have to work twice as hard to get a job done. But please keep Mr Peters on notice that there are expectations from New Zealand First from us, the public, and remind him about the issues that we, the public, are concerned with. Mike, you make some reasonable points there, but some of those questions are not to be put to... Winston Peters, because they're not his ministerial responsibility, particularly around health and education. But we do have an inquiry that's in place because of New Zealand First that is going to look at gene therapy jabs. And New Zealand First has put a, a private member's bill in about transgender toilets. So I don't really need to ask him about those things because he's already done them. But I take your point, and maybe I need to give him a bit of a slap every now and then. Now, Ruth says, so good to hear Cam back on air. Really appreciated the interviews. Winston is always a breath of fresh air. He was very compassionate about the shoplifting greenie. Why is she given so much leeway? She could just be a bad apple but knows how to work the system. How come she gets away with a piddling line 
but some poor young man or woman raised in poverty in a dysfunctional family gets a custodial sentence. Where's the compassion for their crappy life situation and the possible mental struggles? So unfair. Uh, now I've got a comment from Ruth as well about my interview with Nathan Smith. Great interview with Nathan Smith. So glad you brought up the revolving door and sedentary uh, civil service. Surely it's not rocket science to clear the swamp when there's a change of government, especially the heads of department and entrenched managers. The other thing that could be done is to actually streamline the civil service, look to Norway as a country with a similar population base they don't have the clutter and excess of departments and ministries, committees and initiatives. Enough is enough meetings to plan meetings, committees to plan meetings, to plan initiatives, to plan an organisation. What a complete waste of money and time and people power. How about the Swiss model of political service being exactly that, a service to their country, but for a limited time only, and they're not overpaid. Keep it coming, Cam. Good stuff. Uh, we get uh, a few comments, uh, negative comments here, or one negative comment from Trevor. It says, I'd encourage RCR listeners to do some research on Mr. Smith here. He's definitely deflecting and minimising the contents of his blog. Outright racism and sexual violence are never acceptable. Oh, thank you, Trevor, for that comment. It's interesting that all of your views about uh, Nathan Smith would have been formed by mainstream media uh, commentary. And the point is we actually get to talk to the person direct. Uh, we had another comment saying, great interview, Cam has been having some quality guests. Now some comments about Olivia's view. And Olivia, of course, gave us the view on the aftermath of the US presidential debate. This is an anonymous one. I believe Biden and Harris were put in place in 2020 because the deep space state needed two stupid puppets with no spine or attitude to just do what they're told. The people have been hating on Trump daily for eight years, want to create a world none of us want to live in. These people would burn half the world to stop Trump and relinquish power. They're insanely crazy. And Tracy says, Olivia, the unbridled lust for power that Democrats have is without sanction. They will go to any length to retain power. What I fear is a small, deniable nuclear event, which they will almost certainly blame on the Soviets. This could allow the implementation of a command economy controlling, if not suspending, elections. They are that pathological. Now, it's a couple of comments about Cam's buddies. Uh, of course, the buddies dialed in to let us know their thoughts on last week's or, or the previous week's US presidential debate. Salah says, I cannot believe that Cam Slater blames Joe Biden's wife for Joe Biden's poor performance in the debate. Astonishing. Blame a woman who holds no power in Washington. Don't mention the Democratic Party. They only chose him as their nominee. All those qualified candidates and the Dems chose Sleepy Joe. Blaming his wife at every possible opportunity has got to be the laziest, sloppiest accusation that could be made. Okay, if you're talking with your mates at the pub, but Cam Slater has a microphone and he sold his thinking to every one of his buddies. Sloppy. I haven't once heard him question the absence of Robert Kennedy from the debate, and Kennedy is also a presidential candidate. Instead of focusing on Jill, why not put some focus on why the organisers of the debate chose to keep intellect out of the debate? This was a piss-poor effort. Well, thank you, Zella. But you clearly haven't been watching what's been going on in the United States. Jill Biden has an office in the White House. Jill Biden walks Sleepy Joe onto the stage and walks him off the stage. And then she holds rallies where she introduces her husband. So she's donkey deep in this. And she does bear some responsibility because he's her husband and she is pushing him forward in what I consider to be elder abuse. There is no way that Joe Biden is fit for president. And yet there's Jill Biden pushing him forward at every opportunity. Uh, perhaps she should look up uh, uh, on spot on the spiked website, there's an article about the narcissism of Jill Biden. It's very entertaining and very enlightening. And a comment from Diane. I can think about the Biden debate as more about humiliating the US, making them look weak. It amazes me the lack of critical thinking going on in the world. The partisan politics with the media has been laid bare to the normies. So let's see what happens in the UK election. 
Regards, Diane. Well, Diane, we did see what happened in the UK election, and they went from blue to red. And in a few years' time, they'll go from red to blue because, like New Zealand, they haven't learnt to vote in people who actually stand for something. And that's the whale bag for this week. That's it for the crunch this week. Matt McCartan might be from the left, but that doesn't mean he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's always good to hear from all sides. And what do you know? It seems we agree on a fair bit. If only we'd talk. The firearms owning community has been demonized and treated appallingly by politicians and police. So it's good to hear the other side of the argument. Now, to be fair, I'm a firearms owner, so I wasn't going to be hostile. But the rest of the legacy media are. So in this case, RCR is the balance. And that's why Reality Check Radio exists. So we can share these interesting characters with you all, have difficult discussions and not shy away from them. You can keep up with all my shows and indeed all of our shows by using the RCR app. And you can even use the app to stream live. A big thanks to all of the team that helped put this show together and make it all work. It's been a real pleasure having you all back this week. I'm loving all your feedback and really enjoying talking to so many people, sharing their thoughts on politics, life, and everything in between. So a big shout out to you all. Thank you for listening and having faith in me as we continue to explore this beautiful game of politics. Don't forget email suggestions to inbox at realitycheck.radio for people for me to interview. Let's make this show the best political show in New Zealand. Now stay tuned for a repeat of Rodney Hyde's Real Talk coming up next, followed by a replay of Truth Speaker with Tobias Tahi. Looking forward to having you join me again next week for The Crunch with Cam Slater. You've been listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Remember, you can check out the replays for today's show on our website at www.realitycheck.radio forward slash replays. Tune in every Thursday at 4 p.m. for more with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio.